Oh my god. Oh yeah. Oh. I feel like I feel like the uh I feel like the vocals are a little too loud and maybe a little too I sound like I'm in space or something. <laughs> Oh yeah, I don't know anything about reverb. Can I go there? Go, go, go with it. Follow the reverb. Can I get a psychedelic rock band? Follow the reverb. And watch the watch the. All right. My name is Patty. I'm the I'm a nerd. I live in Tucson, Arizona. Oh, you're gonna I'm gonna play some songs for you. Thank you all. Thank you. 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 Thank You know, I play a lot of shows with people who play solo acoustic guitar music, and so if I see someone's about to do that, I'm like, well, you know, I might have seen something very similar to this before, but he totally blew me away, totally, he totally exceeded all of my expectations of what something like that is going to be like. I just, I love this set. And then Toy Cars followed it up with excellent, excellent, uh, just excellent electric rock and roll music, and then, and then these corn people came, and they... And they and they were not one person with acoustic guitar. They were two people with acoustic guitars, and they had and they, and they had wonderful songs. And then and then uh, 
then of course we had Teenage Halloween, an incredible emotional, emotional hardcore band that played. <laughs> And then we have my old friend Brooke Pridemore, who I've just known him for so many years. We've been on tour together. It is great to play with him. It always is. Um, and then Mikey Erg from this amazing band, the Ergs. It's great. It's great to play with him. I think I got everybody. I'm pretty sure that was all the people who played. This has been an amazing show. Thanks to Luke and thanks to the house for having us. This is a song about repetitive things. I took the laundry at the 24 hour place next to the Dollar Tree. I know that I can walk, but got a lot to try. I thought about calling and asking forgiveness, but hell, I'm afraid of the dogs that I live with. I guess I'll take it one thing at a time. I thought about Jesse on Tuesday morning. Last I heard, he was still poked up in Portland. I could call and ask, but hell, I know he'd lie. Like my neighbor, he's got business. If you don't know about it, better keep your distance. Ain't no one on the street ever called a cop in their life. Da-da-da. Like he was already a goner. He said he'd like to change and he could grow his spine. He said when you talk like that, it makes me real nervous. And I told be invite me to your funeral service. Throw down your fucking chips, it's life for keeps this time. Like on Thursday when he called and woke me up. I heard he started smoking crack again and got caught up. Catching cases, robbing houses just to stay. So I hung up, I called Vanessa and I told him that I left the rent on the dresser. It wasn't even half the three weeks late this time. Da da da. Da 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 da. Da 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 da. Da 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 da. On Friday, I do the laundry at the 24 hour place next to the Dollar Tree. Past the neighbors reaching heaven with their trucks so high. I thought about calling and asking forgiveness, but lately I don't even know what that word is. I got police on my six, cause they think it's a crime. Da da da. A da 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 da. A da da da. A da da da. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Let's do Let's do this one. Don't tell me, don't tell me. This one should have a punk band on it. I haven't played this one in a while because I, I always feel kind of funny playing it not in a not like not in a full electric punk band. But you know, this show is pretty punk, you know? You pack in this basement, you know? I don't believe in heaven, I do not believe in hell, it's out of street from here, we both lived there for years, we burned the calendars for war, and the alarm clock just for fun, we closed the blinds and made goddamn sure that we could never see the sun. You just gotta watch by the bottle returns and the ashtrays are flowing on the floor. Now the street, the time when you're so damn poor. But the past is death row and the future's a battlefield. I want to choose the right war. Yeah,
How was everybody's weekend who I didn't talk to over the weekend? All right, let's get that going. Um, I just, the long and short of it, Joe, is that I've just started exclusively playing Pat the Bunny. Pat will never DMCA. Pat will never copyright strike. None of it's part of any label. I can't license it for like broadcast. It's not a thing I can do. So I just decided to play it. He's an anarchist from Vermont. I'm an anarchist from Vermont. I do creative commons. He made music. I, I think he'd understand. I sent him an email. But at the end of the day, yeah, I just started, I decided one day just to throw Pat on and I've been doing it ever since. So yeah, if, if Pat ever has a problem with it, by all means, I'll, I'll do something about it, but I can't ever see him giving a shit. So, um, he is an entertaining singer. He's in, I, I miss him. I miss him. Um, no, no Rev. He's alive. He's alive. He just, he retired. There's too many bad memories attached to the music. Um, his, all of his addiction, all of his heroin and alcoholism and yeah. So he's just living a different life, living a different life. Uh, what's up maniac? What's up? Um, hey left. Um, hey Cricks. Um, ah, good on you, Joe. Uh, wither, wither, wither. My energy is unrelenting in the face of my troubles. Six out of ten weekend. Oh, so three fifths isn't bad. Um, speaks. Yeah, I, I could. Oh, go ahead. Burping. Burping. Um, so how do we want to kick this off? Do we want, do you want Kai's D-Gen story time from the weekend? Do you want headlines? Do you want to just dump into Popo's Bizarre Adventure? We're not just dumping into Popo's Bizarre Adventure. Popo's Bizarre Adventure has a list. Uh, Viva got to sleep. Look at fucking Viva out here flexing. Um, hey, Ace, my Ace. How are you, my dear, my lovely... 
my sweet Cassidy Degen. <laughs> I can hear you, Cass. Dude, Cassie, I can hear you. Um, even not even in my head. I'm pretty sure I just heard you yell that all the way from uh, from Louisiana. You loud. <laughs> Cassidy, Cassidy will get your attention, y'all. If you ever need somebody to fucking say some shit in a crowded theater across the way to your friends to get their fucking attention, get Cassidy. Cassidy will get their fucking attention. Cassidy, Cassidy can project. Um, can we start with story time? Sure. Sure. Um, let's see. Yeah, Ace is here. Joe is here. Look at that. Get Cat's dumbass in here. We can get some shit going. We get nonsense and get Cat in here somewhere. Yeah. Uh, you went to sleep at 7 a.m., so it's been a weird day. Hey, car accident. Congratulations. What books? What books did you uh, did you get? Um, sup, me Toad. Um, so yeah, we'll start with we'll start with DJ. We'll just you know, a little meet and greet here. Um. Publisher here in Brazil is crowdfunding a book on cybernetics and anarchism. And then I remember you talking about, so I bought it. Um, it should be cybernetic theory, not cybernetics. Um, there may be a difference, but we'll see. Ask, I look forward to, like, tell me about it. Let me know what the book is called. Yeah. Um, I'm a genuinely impressive. Uh, so bad. Professor, uh, Southern Baptist professor, uh, Pat professor. Jesus. Uh, one time I genuinely impressed a Southern Baptist pastor with my vocal projection. Usually I speak at registers that don't carry far though. Says Rev. Interesting. Um, a lot rules for radicals, government to no one. And like seven more says car accident. Nice, nice, nice. Joe sleep. Well, sleep. Well, take care of yourself. Yeah. Watch out for excessive mobile bills. Nobody needs that bullshit, man. Data limits are a scam. They are. <laughs> What's your new book, Ace? Sorry about that. Normally I'd try to mute that, but whatever. Um. Oh. So, actually, you know what? What we're going to start with. We're going to start with. Um, Ethan Schmidt Crockett <laughs> Transgender Warriors um, I This is a thread on, Under the commons um, You can get it there If you want um, Dude Cassidy I hear the fucking cheerleader in your voice I hear the cheerleader. Dude, that's... You choir... Fuck choir. Dude, I hear that cheerleader. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. It's like straight up over a football game. Project to the back of the stands. Yeah. Yeah, you got fucking pipes on you, girl. You got fucking pipes. Um... Night, Joe. Sleep well. Um... So... Let's see. Let's start with, um, if you happen to know anybody in Ari in the state of Arizona who is of the LGBTQI, blah, 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 you know any queer folk in uh, Arizona, tell them to keep their fucking heads, heads on a swivel. I posted this over the weekend after I vetted it. There's, um, there's a crazy fucker who's like an anti-masker, conservative, fucking border wall type. He's hunting queer folk in Arizona. I, I say that literally. He's, he's hunting queer folk. Like, the, I, there's, go to the fucking, the, it's a legitimate threat. Um, he and his fucking people are saying shit like, you know, fucking they should all be killed and shit like that in fucking, um, like their anti-masker club, uh, threads and shit like that. Um, there's no such thing as trans kids. What a bunch of gay trolls, pretty sure, blah, blah, blah. There's no such thing as trans kids until a pedo groomer brainwashes them and have them mutilated. Um, you know, stabby duck knife emoji. Um, no, but just wait for it, me toad. Um, he, um, he's already been ejected from, uh, a church because he became violent, 
there. He became aggressive, borderline violent, so the church had to remove him. He is known for past violence. Um, he uh, he is pushing his followers to do the same that he's doing. There's video of him wandering around uh, 10 different stores in the video, um, threatening anybody who supports LGBT plus rights, literally walking into stores going, you got any of those fucking faggot pe uh, fucking pedos in here? Uh, you don't, if you fucking see them, like, straight up, like, yeah, he's going store to store in a video, 10 stores, and threatening anybody who supports L LGBT rights. Um, he literally uh, 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 uploaded a video <clears throat> um, of him in a parking lot searching for, he said, I'm out hunting for, uh, for, these, uh, for these queers, shit like that. He, is, he does have a history of violence. He does have a history of aggressive actions. He has been ejected from multiple places for borderline behavior. And uh, his name is Ethan Schmidt Crockett. Um, and his videos are all... Um, rooted in things like super fucking homophobic, transphobic, racist, um, you know, like I said, anti-masker, anti-masker, uh, anti border wall, uh, the foreigners, the Jews, the queers, that guy. Um, so, yeah. Like, that's, it, it's, it's a credible threat. So, yeah. Um, he apparently has harassed a couple of churches. The security guards at the second church ejected him as soon as he was in the parking lot. Um, like before he even got to the front door. But, um, yeah, he's also, um, <laughs> it's Arizona. <laughs> it's still legal to fucking shoot a guy for giving you a queer look in Arizona. Are you shitting me? It's fucking Arizona. Why hasn't he been charged? <laughs> <laughs> oh. So, yeah, we need to just start with that. Um, if you want any of the details, some of the screenshots of the internal communications in his group, um, some of the explanation, it's under, it's in a thread under uh, the Commons called uh, "Legitimate Threat to LGBT Plus People in Arizona." Details attached. <clears throat> yeah oh yeah ace 100 percent, 100 percent, 100 percent. yeah you're you're one of the darkies they'd have fucking tagged you immediately they'd probably try to um deport you too they don't care shades of brown it's arizona they'd be like eh she's brown good enough they'd hold up the chart okay like, mm. send her to mexico Um, what are the new regs actually? Yeah, I don't care. Um, oh, it's just a kit background. It's so it's a kit background in serialization. Also mandates firearm dealer status, serial number to any ghost ghost guns. I, you know, that's not the end of the world. The sky isn't falling on that one. So, uh, I saw something possible uh, commercial about how illegals are threatening the workers' rights in Utah. Has anyone else seen this alleged commercial? Nope, Ace, I have not. Yeah, it's all like grand scheme. Mm. I mean, there's not that many ghost gun part kit type things actually in circulation. The majority of the firearms in this country are serialized already. It would bring them in compliance with that standard process. So if the gun people don't have a problem with the fucking serialization of their firearms, so some of them do actually. Um, but if they're, they are willing to accept that as a step, then I don't see much difference in this, but
Hey, commodity. What's a semi? Oh, what's a semi truck driver? Is it a driver that only does part of the route? Is it a little person? Carlin. Uh, Rev, being white passing is definitely a benefit in the South. I had a friend in high school who recently caught shit for being too tanned. He had some native blood, but everyone and their dog is a descendant of a Cherokee princess around here, and that heritage is generally respected, whether proven or not. There. Um, so, all right. Ace, calm down. <laughs> Ace, you are a mother. You are a college student. Knock that shit off. <laughs> Uh, Cherokee good, Mexican bad, Arkansas. Um, I, yes, um, well, one of them, oh, fuck, you put it in politics? Yeah, um, the fucking data broker thing, uh, I don't know if I'll get into it tonight, but trust me, dude, that was, I don't know what your second one was, but the John Oliver one was on everybody's front page. Um, that one, it's interesting, we'll see, we'll see what happens. Um, it could be classified as extortion, it, but he's got the attorneys to fucking, you know, cover his ass. Uh, oh, I should start talking shit about them. <laughs> then, uh, uh, cupcake. All right. So. Hey, guy. Um, all right, let's do D-Gen. Uh, where's the sign? There's the sign. All right. A little D-Gen story time before we dump into Popo's Bizarre Adventures. Um, so, I was, um, I was hanging out Saturday night, um, with Cat, Buddhist, um, and, uh, uh, Cat Buddhist and I forget who else was on the line. I think Caleb may have been kind of there, but you fucking clipped out fairly like early. Um, um, so I have, let's call it a net out, right? Fisherman, right? Um, anybody who wants to hook up anybody that wants to have a certain level of sexual activity um especially that of a kinky style in their life you got to keep the net out right you got to keep the line in the water you got to keep fishing you got to keep fishing the, the fish ain't going to jump into your boat for you usually so you got to keep fishing so we were playing uh, we were playing zomboid had some food going in the background and something came through and so um did you say God has made you a fisher of men? Yeah, Marcus. Um, praise Jeebus. So, <clears throat> something comes through. And I, um, let's just hang on. Let's, uh, for the purposes of. So, I'm like, all right, all right, boys. I'm going to have to go at, like, midnight. Like, I need to, like, leave at midnight. So, like, 11.45, that sort of thing. We were making decent progress, too, on Zomboid, which we got to the next day. But, so, I'm like, I got to go. So, what happened was, um, in summation, I almost killed a guy. <laughs> I'm not kidding you. I very really almost killed a guy. And in the most ego boosting fucking ridiculous manner ever. Um, there's no way to walk out of this situation without like. Yeah, there's no fucking way. There's no fucking way. Um, so. The guy was into uh, some pup play. That was his deal. He had the mask. He had the, the, the sort of persona for it. He likes to be considered, a, you know, a pup. A dog. All right, whatever. I was there for another reason. Um, let's just say, because you know I don't like to get too gory with the details. Um, 
let's just say all bases were checked. Um, but um, it's gonna. Oh. So for those that follow along with Kai's level of degeneracy, arm deep. From what you described, I'd call him a puppet, says Caboose. Yes, um, arm deep. Impressive. It actually impressive. I was, I complimented him several times. I was like, not bad. Not bad. Um, so, <laughs> Buddhist, I can hear you say that. Um, Dude, over 9,000. Yeah, Aspen. Yeah. And um, it's... Okay. Not. But. Yeah. Like proper. Mm -mm. Mm. It was it was impressive. What's up, Glazy? Um, it was impressive. But... It is not any of the, um, it wasn't any of that that was the uh, potential damage. I didn't kill him by that. It was very impressive, his capability doing that. Um, when I first walked in, I had him kneeling in front um, of me. Um, I looked down and I noticed a couple of things. I noticed a jaw sort of, okay. He's got the pup mask, but I can still see movement and I'm noticing like an elevated breathing rate and not just like a normal elevated breathing rate. I'm seeing like a labored breathing. So I ask. Because I don't put up with that, by the way. I don't put up with that. I said, are you spun? No, he wasn't spun. For those of you who uh, don't know what spun means, it means on crystal meth. Um, so I looked at him and I said, are you spun? No, he wasn't. He sort of, he goes, I have to... Have, and he takes off the fucking pup mask, right? And I look at him and I'm like, what's going on? I move him to his couch, get him off his knees and move him to his couch. Right? Um, and just talk him down a little bit and, oh, fucking a cat. Um, talk him down a little bit from it and I'm like, what's going on? And he goes, I had childhood asthma that scarred my lungs very badly. <sighs> and occasionally I can get an anxiety attack and it'll trigger my asthma like it used to be. <sighs> and I'm like, okay, so what triggered your anxiety attack? Now, I'm still standing over him. I've just got him sitting on the couch and he looks up at me and he goes, you're just so hot. I don't know why you're here. I almost killed a dude by being hot, guys. He almost fucking suffocated to death. Like, he almost had an asthma attack. And, like, completely passed the fuck out. Because I was hot. Caboose, I told you, there's no way to walk away from the situation situation without just like liquid ego fuel, right? Like it's just absolutely, absolutely ridiculous. Yeah, I almost killed a dude by being hot. <laughs> God, the level of gayness I feel in this moment. So that's how it started. It finished with me arm deep which just impressive impressive capability in that gentleman 
Um, I was I was right right chuffed. I was fucking yeah. That's that's damn. Um, with no warm up. Mm-hmm. It was impressive. Um, but damn your hotness. Um, yeah. So that's that's sort of what happened there. Um, you know, after I got him calmed down and okay and understanding that I'm there for a good time and fucking, you know, just, just leave it at the door, man. No worries. No worries. Which by the way, I made him answer the door naked. Um, anyway, um, I do that with most of the subs. If I'm going there. Yeah. If they come here, they're naked as soon as they walk in. If I go there, they enter the door naked. Um, dude, I love, I love, this is my favorite part about being a Dom, by the way, is no surprises. I love no surprises. I absolutely adore it. I just, I, I outline and any deviation from that, I get to like whip somebody's ass for it. <laughs> Are you shitting me? It's a great, from, from, from my brain. Yeah, that makes, that feels good. That feels good. The topping, whatever. Uh, <laughs> the actual doming. I, I will tell you, I get more, I get more out of the doming than I do the topping. The topping means nothing to me. The doming on the other hand, holy shit, that scratches an itch. Um, but yeah, I, you know, almost killed a dude by being attractive. Um, and then I went fucking arm deep in him and then balls, balls deep. Um, but yeah, it was, um, a cat. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, that was, so I, you know, a couple hours rolled out, came home, fucking fed myself again. Uh, cause you know, I got a modicum of food in me, but I didn't want to, um, you know, stuff myself, you know, in performance mode. I just need a little bit of protein and some carbs, you know, slow burn carbs to, for the athletic activity that I'd be engaging in. And, you know, I, I, I treat him, uh, I treated him, you know, I, I, I know my aftercare, right. And so I knew what he needed and what he, what he, what he needed more than what he wanted afterwards. Um, so I took care of him, but yeah, came home and then the next day we actually got to finish the Project Zomboid stuff that I wanted to, like, you know, finish with Buddhist. Um, but yeah, that that was that was the DGen story time from the weekend. Um, and Zippy, I just look for the DGen sign now for DGen story time clips. I just I just look for the the DGen when it's on and off. That's my markers now. Um, so, oh good God, I wish I had that problem. Um, so yeah, not bad. <laughs> That's totally what happened to me too. <clears throat> Says Rev. Oh yeah. Let me answer this by the way. Hold on. So, yeah, there's your DGen story time. Uh, let's move back over to politics. Ugh. Done. Um, I did wait. Wait, hold on. All right, whatever. <sighs> Jesus. Oh, yeah. Dude, that RDF was a pain in the ass, too. All right, cool. Thank you, Cupcake. G-Gen politics. Well, we will be getting into Popo's Bizarre Adventures, and Popo's Bizarre Adventures actually has uh, two, oh, no, 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 two, um, four, six, eight, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18, 20, 20 ish stories attached to it today. 
So, you know, it's been a week. I think I think these are best done on Mondays. Um, have the abortion trans arrest started? Uh, you, well, Texas, yeah. Uh, they, they released her. But, you know, she had a fucking miscarriage. She had a stillbirth. And they are fucking arrested her. Dude, she's going to sue everybody. Good on her. Um, yeah. I think these are best left till Monday. So we can go over the last week, basically. That's that's what we... I think that's the pattern that we'll do. And maybe... Um, fucking... We'll leave... Um, well, I'll figure out a slot for... Um, we're going to do, I think, rather than stack them like I do the Popo's Bizarre Adventures, I think I'll do, like, a feature one at a time. And even if it's just, like, a minute. Even if it's, I, I did rev, I just don't care. <laughs> um, fucking, uh, even if it's just a minute featuring every single, as we cycle through, all of the social conservatives that are, like, pedophiles and raping children and shit like that, like, actively, that we're like, yeah, he's doing 12 years for, like, molesting both of his daughters. That sort of shit. Like, Dennis Hassert, fucking, you know, <laughs> speaker of the fucking, you know, fucking, yeah, diddling, like, 14-year-old boys. Like, I, I think that that's how I'm going to format that one. So we'll probably do those occasionally. How do you know I voted for Biden? You didn't even ask me a question. That's interesting. Do you even understand my politics? Do you know what I'm about? Dude. Just, just want to make an assumption. Here's, here's a hint. I believe everyone should have guns no matter what. I think guns should be universally allowed in this country. Fuck the Second Amendment. Guns for all. Except cops. Cops shouldn't be allowed to have guns. Yeah. So, superstar. Superstar! Also, I mean, you know, Trump's first impeachment was for illegally denying military aid to Ukraine when Putin invaded it. But, you know, whatever. Who's got time for details? Interesting. It's my fault that Russia started using chemical weapons today. Fascinating. I, I, it's interesting that you want to actually engage in a conversation. I can see that you're definitely here to act in good faith and have details to back it up. Yeah. So what if I voted for Trump? How is that my fault then? What if I didn't vote at all? You've never even asked me wh who I voted for. She's fascinating. Since it's Biden's fault, right? God, Malefica, God damn it, Kai. I told you not to invent Novichok. My bad. My bad. I, you know, what are we going to do? Hey, do the right thing and get on air and actually stop being a coward and have the conversation with me then. I'll talk to you about this. I'll talk to you about this. I will. But... You need to stop being a keyboard warrior and actually um, fucking have the conversation. Oh. <laughs> Puka, I was bored, so. Yeah, Glazy, they invaded while Trump was president. You do realize that, right? While Trump was president, Russia invaded Ukraine. Yeah, that that actually happened. Trump's first impeachment was for illegally denying military aid to Ukraine. 
Like, this is... This isn't even a fucking argument. Like, yeah. Yeah, it would have happened because it happened. Like, it literally happened on his watch. Yeah. Yeah. Trump would have handed Ukraine to Russia. He would have handed Ukraine to Russia. Um, what we got? What we got? I know Viva. I know, right? Ah. Oh. No, Cupcake. I think I think that person has already left. Yeah. Yeah, Glazy. Dude, it, he... Yeah. Dude, Russia ran roughshod over fucking Trump. Probably because they've got a tape of him banging two 12-year-olds or some shit. But that's neither here nor there. That's speculation. It's real. Um, so... People forget the type of absolute shit stain Trump actually was. Dude, it's already fading. It's already fading. The shit, like the sheer number of sh things that he got up to. It's already fading. That memory hole's a motherfucker. <laughs> uh, but, yeah. So, oh, Jesus. Hey, nonsense. Dude, I want to get all of you here. Ace was here. Nonsense. Uh, so Ace and uh, Joe were here simultaneously in the beginning. I don't know if Ace is still here. Ace, speak up if you are. Um, nonsense and Cat are here now. I want to get all four of you fuckers together. Let's see. No. No, Ace is gone already. Um, so, yeah, Ace and Joe left. Yeah. Yeah, Ace has come, it comes through, like, a couple of times... Every once in a while for a start of stream to say hi. Um, say what's up to Taz for me. Nonsense. Say what say what's up to Taz. Um Oh. What's up, Dazzle? I don't think I know you. So how was your stream? What'd you guys get up to? Um Yeah. Oh, yeah. Cupcake. As soon as as soon as I asked him to get on the air and actually defend that position, fucking the dude ran. The dude ran. Um, they're good people. Says they're goo people. I don't know if that's a good thing then or not. Crick says, <laughs> "Fucking, are you goo people? Should we be watching out?" Um, but welcome. Um, if Crick's vouches for you, you're you're good with me then. Um, how was your stream? What'd you guys get up to? Um, we're about to just start, um, <laughs> we are DJs. Um, we're about to start Popo's Bizarre Adventures. We're just sort of, we're, we're just sort of leaning into it. Um, so if you don't know what Popo's Bizarre Adventures is, it's a segment we do on this show, um, that is, uh, documenting the, um, malfeasances, uh, of the police, especially within the U.S. based system, but abroad as well. So... Oh, 3 a.m. there. Oh, Jesus Christ. There we go. Got that scratched. Um, interesting. Duly noted, cat. Dude, I got a fucking itch. Just, dude, some neuropathy shit. It's just some neuropathy shit. There's just a fucking itch on my back that keeps firing off. Oh, it's going to scratch all around it. Bear with me. Um,. The life of somebody with fucking small fiber neuropathy. Sometimes it just fucking itches. Um, be sure, yeah, take your antidepressants prior to Popo's. Uh, yeah, Popo's Bizarre Adventures can get kind of fucked up sometimes. Um, I, I don't have, um, I don't have a, a Rondini uh, level story uh, for this week. So we're not doing like a deep dive into the just horrible, horrible tragedy. Um, Hi, Walata. Jesus Christ, we're doing this, huh? What's up, Alex? 
Um, thanks for the raid. Fucking Starlight Dazzle just raided. Now you guys are raiding. We're just about to start Popo's Bizarre Adventures. Oh, we already did D-Gen story time, so sorry you missed that one. But if you want, it'll be up on the YouTube channel um, sometime later tonight, and you can hear the small story about how I almost killed a dude with my hotness. True story. True story. I almost killed a dude with my hotness over the weekend. Um, so, yeah. Um, but welcome. Welcome, welcome. Uh, so let us begin, I suppose. Um, let me move this over. Oh, God, that's a lot of tabs. <clears throat> hey, dear XP, thank you for the follow. Uh, Helen of Boy over here. I like that one. That's a good one. Um, Helen of Boy. Hey, Waldo, thanks for the follow as well. Uh, so... Yeah, Rev, that'll do it. That'll do it. Um, uh, all right. So, is that really all right? Oh, uh, pop that back up there. Pop that there. All right. So this isn't directly Popo's, but I wanted to kick off with it. So Popo's Bizarre Adventures, y'all. So the IRS audits the poor at five times the rate of everyone else. This is um, the, uh, the records clearinghouse at uh, the transactional records clearinghouse at Syracuse University did an analysis of IRS data. Um, essentially, what they found was that for tax returns le earning less than $25,000 per year, out of a thousand, 13 would be audited. So 13 out of a thousand uh, um, returns that are less than $25,000 a year earnings are audited. Compare that with incomes above $25,000. That is a rate of 2.6 per 1,000. So that's five times the rate of everyone else. If you are broke, poor, in this country, like straight up broke, right? This is poverty territory. If you're poor, you're getting audited by the IRS five times as much as anybody else. And I consider that police uh, police action as far as anything else. Um, they, they call it correspondence audits because they tend to use letters more than they do um, physical face-to-face -face visits, but still, it's some bullshit. Um, I literally can't file taxes for my dad right now because his state ID is expired and he'd have to have either street address bills or a paycheck to prove his address. So he literally can't get an ID. So he literally can't file his taxes. That sounds about right, Rev. That sounds about right. Um, so just right out of the gate. Yes, punished because poor. That's it's super common in our country. So, right out of the gate, let's just start with the IRS. Now, moving on, there's a video attached to our next story. Some of you had to have seen it. Um, oh, that's right, that's age-gated, and what I wanted to do was um, that. Okay, we'll do that right there. Um, so... Next up, next up, Tulsa. Oh, Tulsa, 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 Tulsa. Um, so Monday, I think, yeah, last Monday, um, some footage got posted to Facebook um, f uh, Monday night showing a Tulsa police officer rattling a locked door and laughing as she attempts to persuade a 70-year-old woman uh, to come out of a restroom. She's locked herself in. 
And so it, let's just say it, it's God. Okay. So Ronnie Cora, Cora, uh, Coracia, mm, I don't know. Either way, that's the arresting officer that is listed on the paperwork. Um, so ah, they're attempting to take a woman by the name of LaDonna June Paris into custody. Um, so here we go. Let's just, you know, on, on the grand scheme of things, like I can actually show this video. Um, it's, it's surprising that I can actually show a video attached to some of these stories on Twitch. Um, but I can with this one. You can hear. You want to get tased? Yeah, then come out. You want to get tased? Don't do it. This is going to be so fun. Dark blue or dark Want to change something? We have a we have like a crisis team, but they're busy right now. They like handle and spe like mental health. It's like mental health specialist, therapist. She just keeps rambling. And CRT is busy, of course. She is mental as all. Yeah. If she opens that door, my hands are going. You want to get tased? Yeah, then come out. You want to get tased? Don't do it. I love my job. <laughs> Oh, we're just having a fucking buffer. Uh, we're just having a uh, a bit rate drop. That's I just paused it really quickly. Quaker Oats, thanks for the follow. Oh, don't let the oh, thank you, thank you. Don't let this represent all cops. See, this is a fun thing, D, uh, DRXP. I do a segment called Popo's Bizarre Adventures, where I document malfeasance amongst the police officers of this nation and abroad every week. Every week. And you know what? It's always a fucking shit show. 20 a week. I can get no problem. No problem. Without even trying. So here's the thing. I've done the numbers. I've done the statistical analysis. I've written the essays on police violence in America and violence towards police in America. I have those numbers as well. Um, and I do a, seg a recurring segment where we look at the abuses of police. Here's the th here, oh, and I've written um, historical uh, historical slash contemporary analysis essays um, that on the origins of and problems with modern policing. This is a topic I'm intimately familiar with. My stepfather was a, uh, was a judge. I have lots of like federal law enforcement in my family and that sort of thing. I am I'm actually really well versed in this topic. Uh, this is a systemic issue. This is all cops. Um, the good cops get run out of the police organizations. They, w the whistleblowers, either end up dead or threatened to be killed. Um, almost always, uh, I would say more often than not, but almost always. There's very few instances of when they get pr uh, they get protected. Um, so yeah, uh, I hate to be the bearer of bad news on this one, but this is an all cops problem. Because the very system they operate under is a system of coercion and oppression and monopolized force uh, at the hands of the state to control a populace. 
So as far as I'm concerned, yeah, all cops are bastards. And the good ones, they don't remain cops very long. The smart ones don't get into the police force at all. Cops are professional class traders, says Carpe. Yeah. Um, so. Yeah, no. So good luck with that. Good luck with that. Anyway, back to the shit, shit human being. No, you don't get to tell me what to do. That's not how this works. Okay, yes, but cops are trying to kill me here. Can you believe this kind of thing's happening? <laughs> She's so 85. Can you believe this kind of thing's happening? <laughs> She's so 85. <laughs> And the door's locked. Acknowledging um, she needs mental health treatment. To knock it down, yeah, I don't care. You need to come out. But she's very 85. I asked for CRT. Imagine. Don't Google, but use DuckDuckGo. I don't know. I really hope it is Ritter because I really like the way he works. <laughs> oh, yeah. He's going to pound the door open and spray her. I really like the way he works. He's going to pound this door open and spray her. It's going to be so fun. The big one. Yep. Here we go. Woo! 70 year old woman. Rufus, I need you, Rufus. I need you, Rufus. Oh, she's good. L.A. Um, what are you doing that to me? Cass, I need my son Cass. I need my son. Stop. Rufus, I need you. Stop it. L.A. L.A., stop it. Stop it. You're hurting me. Okay. I'm sure they are. I don't mind. I don't want to stop it. Put your other arm. Give it your other arm. Now. Boy, it's nice, Shepherd. Come on, boy. You need to use a light down. You need to use a light down. You can't do it. Oh, you're a story for me. Sure, they should be some mercy. Yeah, I'm a crime. Get your hands on my pants. That is so nasty. Yeah, this one's unnecessary. You're right. We didn't have to do any of this. And I'm sorry. I'm really, really She's apologizing to them now. She is bleeding yeah, everywhere no, and she just wants to clean up the blood. Starlight, I had to pull that. I understand. Thank you. Thank you. She's thanking them. I said sit down. Sit okay. down. I will. I will. Okay. Never followed you, okay? You're hurting me. Please. Please don't hurt me. Oh, why are you doing Stop. this to me? Oh, God. Oh, God. Madonna. Just relax. Shiva. Do you know Shiva? Madonna. Of the English? Madonna. Yeah, you're Madonna. arrested right now. We I'm have what to be. You're arrested. Why? What have I done? Arson. What? Me? You try to light us on oh, fire. I never do that. I'm a woman of God. She's a bipolar having manic episodes, but she's anal four, so we couldn't make her do anything. Kay. So we called you guys for assistance, and then she just took off. Took off? And, you okay. Know, it, you, there wasn't any really grounds to do anything. Gotcha. Um, is, I mean, what do you guys got going on right now? So she was in the bathroom for five hours. They asked her to leave. She said no. Then we asked her to leave. She said no, and we had to oh, force look. into the bathroom. They lied to then, too. Here. She tried to set the bathroom on fire. She had a lighter with like the spray. Yeah, she had a lighter with the spray, like spraying oh, at the door. Who would have guessed? They us. attempted to cover so cover up. She needs to go to jail now for probably arson, trespassing, obstruction because she wouldn't leave, resisting, all that stuff. So yeah, that's that's where we're at now. So. I don't know what you like. If you're gonna play stupid games, you're gonna win stupid prizes. I'm just I'm over it. And that is how you know there's a systemic issue. Hey, DRXP or whatever the fuck your name was. How do you explain the all the charges being dismissed? How do you explain the solitary confinement for a month in county jail? How do you explain the lack of mental health treatment? It's not just the cops at the scene. Clearly county's in on it. Clearly the court system's in on it. Clearly the DA's in on it. Yeah, it's a big, big, fuck. Tulsa. 
Tulsa, by the way. It's not a big city. It's just Tulsa. How do you explain all that? That seems like a systemic issue, not just a couple of cops. Hmm, interesting. Anyway, so there's LaDonna Paris being beat the fuck up in the middle of a, you know, br- mental illness break. Uh, hey, Ace. Ace is back. Uh, image. Where's my copy address? There's my copy address. Nope, that's not my copy address. There we go. Is that fire? Oh. So, the next story. Again, remember, don't don't let this this singular officer <clears throat> color cops for you. Even though we'll be bouncing around the country and showing a multitude of examples. Um, and we do this every week. And every week it generally takes us, what, two to four hours to cover these stories. There's so many of them in a singular week. Um, but don't worry. There's not that many issues. So the state of Georgia... has reached a, um, a $4.8 million st- uh, settlement. Um, is that? Yeah. There we go. Okay. So the state of Georgia has reached a $4.8 million settlement. The, g- the gentleman on the left is a, um, a, a former state police officer by the name of Jacob Thompson. Now, the gentleman who's actually a gentleman is on the right. His name is Julian Lewis, or, well, to spoil the story, I suppose, um, his name was Julian Lewis. So... Our, our <clears throat> friendly officer here claimed that he was attempting to pull Mr. Lewis over for a uh, alleged broken taillight. Now, that's the thing. We don't have any evidence for that broken taillight. But he, has a, um, he, he claims that he was allegedly uh, pull, tr- attempting to pull Mr. Lewis over for a broken taillight while Mr. Lewis was on the way to the store to buy his wife a soda. Um, he did not immediately stop on the bumfuck road. He did what is recommended, by the way, uh, by uh, 911 and police agencies around this country, if you are uncertain about a police stop, that you pull over to a more familiar area, a well-lit area, a place with more people. It's a practice commonly taught to people who may feel vulnerable in isolated areas um, where there is no one there to witness potential events. The police themselves actually instruct individuals to do this. It is speculated that this is what Mr. Lewis was attempting to do. Um, Lewis activated both turn signals. He put on his hazards in recognition of the um, former state trooper here. Um, The trooper then decided why, oh yes, Carpe, very much. Um, the trooper then decided that this was seen, to be seen as an act of defiance, I suppose, and an illegal act unto itself. And so he then crashed his, uh, his, his car into Mr. Lewis's car using a pit maneuver um, and with enough force at enough speed to spin Lewis's car in the opposite direction. And less than two seconds passed from the time that the trooper opened the door to his vehicle and fired a shot, killing Lewis instantly. 
60 years old. He looks good for 60, by the way. Um, probably would have lived to like a thousand. Yes. So when he didn't immediately pull over, he pit maneuvered him. And this is according to the GBI's Georgia Bureau of Investigations own investigator's testimony. This isn't defense. This is the Georgia Bureau of Investigation's own findings. Less than two seconds passed from the time that the officer opened the door to his vehicle to the time that the shot was fired that killed Mr. Lewis instantly. So, yeah. The officer claimed that he heard Lewis's engine revving to a high rate, to a high RPM, and feared for his life after the pit maneuver. Um, here's the fun part. After further investigation, neither taillight on Lewis's car was in a condition of inoperability that would lead to justifiable cause for the stop. And, 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 and mechanics found that the impact of the pit maneuver made it impossible for Lewis's car to rev. So, our officer here lied about his justifiable cause, attacked a random civilian just running, just driving down the street trying to get his wife some fucking uh, soda, slammed his car into it, spun him around, hopped out of his car, and executed him. Now, here's where it gets really interesting. There's no body cam because he wasn't wearing a fucking body cam. In fact, Georgia officials refused to release the patrol car dash cam footage of the incident whatsoever uh, in absolute uh, in totality. No, Carpe, they refused to release the dash cam footage. So, the settlement was done by Hall and Lampros. Hall and Lampros are these like crazy fucking civil rights attorneys. It's, it's a firm that handles personal injury and civil rights lawsuits. And that's what they do. They're spe they specialize in it. So they are, um, they, uh, they, they have the largest, uh, um, um, tort settlements in Georgia history. Like these, these fuckers are responsible essentially for the maximum amount in Georgia. Like they, they, they will hit you for the maximum amount and they're good at it too. So they, uh, they handled that $4.8 million settlement to the widow of, uh, Julian Lewis. Um, but opacity is guilt. It is. If, if you refuse to be transparent, if you go opaque on this, then a hundred percent, um, let me get you a, a, a Breen. I, I saw it go. Um. There you go. Um, yes. Mr. Lewis was extrajudicially, summarily executed by a state official. Uh. Oh, Ace, I'm sorry. Today's the anniversary of my brother's murder by a cop, says Ace. I left for the candlelight vigil we hold yearly. Three years he's been gone, all for being a black man in the wrong place at the wrong time. Yep. 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 Black wall driving. Black wall driving. <sighs> so... A jury, 
don't know, cops, right? But a jury in Ar- uh, in Arizona is going to have to decide whether a former police officer used excessive force when he shot a man in the testicles with his taser as his two minor children stood by watching and crying. This is a federal judge who has ruled because uh, he has unsealed it um, last Wednesday. He has ruled because they, t- they, the officer and his defense attempted to claim qualified immunity. Uh, Glazy, we're kind of doing that. Each, each Popo's Bizarre Adventure has all the links attached. So every video that I, cu- uh, that I do this in, the, the links are below the video. So fun- functionally, we are creating a giant list, yes. Um, yes, they, they attempted to uh, uh, argue that the officer should have qualified immunity for, uh, because he didn't know he wasn't supposed to shoot a dude in the balls with his taser repeatedly when he was handcuffed following a traffic stop. Oh, that's right. Did I forget to mention the individual in question here? He did a minor traffic stop, dragged him out of his, out of his car, handcuffed him, and then tased him in the balls repeatedly. And then they put the fucking shitty DA and the bullshit court system surrounding it, put him in jail for months for resisting arrest. Wait for it. Before all charges were dismissed. So... Oh, dig, the wind is insane, isn't it? He approached this man, he approached the man and his wife, um, Johnny Wheatcroft, by the way. Um, the officer, we shouldn't always name check, always name check, Matthew Schneider, um, the piece of shit officer for Glendale, Arizona, named Matthew Schneider, um, assaulted Johnny Wheatcroft in the parking lot of a Motel 6. Essentially, he and his wife were already parked in the motel parking lot when bullshit officer Schneider fucking pulled up and said that he failed to signal to turn. Probably bullshit, seeing as we don't have any video evidence of that either. Um, He failed to signal when turning into the parking lot. Wheatcroft told the officer he did nothing wrong and refused to provide ID. Schneider said he'd take Wheatcroft to the police station. He accused him of stuffing something between the car seats and a bag between his feet, which Wheatcroft denied. Schneider then opened the passenger door, placed his taser on Wheatcroft's shoulder, and told Schneider to relax his arm and stop tensing up. This is when Schneider used his taser on Wheatcroft 11 times. We, uh, we do have the body cam footage. At least the court did. We don't have it. But body cam footage shows Wheatcroft lying face down on the pavement with his shorts pulled down while Schneider deploys his taser, quote, in an area that appears to be close to Wheatcroft's genitals while the man's children can be seen in frame and heard screaming, and crying, no daddy, no. He, um, Officer Schneider, of course, was put on paid vacation for uh, three days following the incident. Um, <laughs> the Maricopa County Attorney's Office, of course, refused, they declined to press charges against the officer. Um, after the police body camera footage was <clears throat> finally gotten uh, gotten by attorneys in 2020, the case was officially reopened, and that's when the state attorney general's office charged Snyder, who was retired from the force with a pension at that point. But in Wheatcroft's civil suit, against the city, Glendale argued that its officers were entitled to qualified immunity. U.S. District Court Judge uh, Michael Liberty said, no, no, (laughs) you do not get qualified immunity for tasing a dude 11 times in the balls for a made up traffic stop. That's not how qualified immunity works. So 
He, um, the claims of excessive force, civil rights violations, intentional and negligent infliction of emotional distress will move forward. And the judge concluded that a jury will be allowed to decide if Wheatcroft was or was not resisting arrest and whether Schneider's use of the taser was justified. Um, so this is, this is the judge's own writing, by the way, this is the judge's own writing. So if you wonder which way this is going to go. Under the version of facts as told by plaintiffs, Wheatcroft ordered no, uh, offered no resistance to the officers. The video of the incident reflect Wheatcroft verbally telling officers he is not resisting. Liberty found Wheatcroft's deposition testimony provides additional evidence that a jury could rely on to conclude he was not resisting. So, yeah, in before the jury's full of cop lovers. I know, right? Well, and they're not all bad. Um, so qualified immunity struck down for, um, tasing a dude in the balls 11 times. Hmm, interesting. Who would have guessed? Um, this, this decision, uh, Thompson v. Clark is a good decision, but it still leaves a bunch of barriers in place. I'm going to move on to the Supreme Court. Um, last Monday, the Supreme Court made it easier to sue police and prosecutors for malicious, malicious prosecution. There's other um, cases in the way. Uh, or there's other um, barriers to pr uh, prevent such lawsuits still in the way. But this is kind of the, 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 the hilarity of it. This is, this is the psychotic nature of it. This is the abuse of the system. Um, the case is... Um, the, the, the Thompson v. Clark case centers around a diaper rash. Now, for those of you that understand and follow cop stories in America, like the dude in Florida, the gentleman who was pulled over and had um, donut glaze in his, um, in his like passenger seat from eating donuts on the go, and they fucking field tested it positive for methamphetamine and threw him in jail for a bunch of months and fucking kept it on his record. He's still fighting to get that record expunged, by the way. Um, yeah, this is, this is a thing when a non-issue becomes a very big fucking issue. Diaper rash is at the center of the, uh, the Thompson v. Clark case. Um, Larry Thompson was living with his, uh, then fiance, now wife, they married, but they had a newborn baby when his sister-in-law, <clears throat> apparently suffering from, let's call it mental illness, called 911 claiming that Thompson was abusing his baby. When EMT and officers arrived, they were admitted to the apartment by the sister-in-law, who arguably doesn't have rights to do that. Uh, but Thompson, who was unaware at that time of his sister-in-law's actions calling 911, told them they must have the wrong address. The EMT officers left but returned to the apartment then with four New York City police officers. And NYPD is just some of the most stand-up individuals in the world. We all know that, right, guys? NYPD is some of the most reasonable, sane, rational, de-escalating, non-violent individuals in the world. It's not like there's ever been a movie about them trying to execute their own cops when, uh, when they attempt to whistleblow on them. Oh, wait, there is. It's called Serpico. Um, so yeah, you can, you can see where, um, where this is headed right away. Ah, this time Thompson answered the door and refused to admit them unless they had a search warrant. Come back with a fucking warrant. The police then did what NYPD does. They threw Thompson on the floor and handcuffed him while the EMT examined the baby. Um, <laughs> Thank you, Buck the Trend friend. Um, <clears throat> what? Mm. Um, they threw uh, the uh, the police threw him to the ground, handcuffed him while the EMTs examined the baby. The only marks found on the baby were diaper rash. The baby was taken out of their custody to the hospital for further examination, where the diaper rash diagnosis was confirmed. Dun, dun. Thompson, though, Thompson 
was thrown in jail for two days and charged with resisting arrest and obstructing governmental administration. Again, again, guys, guys, it's only a couple of bad apples. I don't know what you guys are talking about all the time, about how all the cops and the whole system is corrupt and bad, facilitating the abuses that are occurring on, uh, on the individual level such as these. I don't know what you guys are going on about. Anyway, so he was... Um, he was charged with resisting arrest and obstructing governmental uh, administration. Now... Eventually, prosecutors tried to offer him a deal in which his record would eventually be wiped clean. But Thompson refused. Uh, no, I know. A few, a few bad apples spoil the bunch. I know, Omicron. Um, he refused, and prosecutors subsequently dropped all charges. So for you pointing out that diaper rash can get pretty bad, like bleeding, apparently it wasn't bad enough because no child abuse or neglect charges were ever filed whatsoever. And the only charges were, again, resisting arrest and obstructing governmental administration. And all charges were dropped. So, hmm... It seems like this is a classic case of malicious prosecution. So, the New York State Appeals Court actually found that Thompson had to prove his innocence, that his innocence had, uh, that to prove his innocence had been, quote, affirmed, okay? So, the dropping of charges wasn't explanation enough. The fact that they just said, we're not, we're not touching this. Uh, was not an affirmation of his innocence. Well, too bad. On Monday, our bullshit Supreme Court, the fucking, with fucking beer bro and rapey dude and fucking, well, okay, beer bro and rapey dude could be the same guy. I'm talking about Terrence Cl uh, uh, Clarence Thomas as the rapey dude. See Anita Hill. Um, so, you know, Kavanaugh rapey dude, Thompson, uh, uh, Thomas rapey dude, fucking, you know, T take your pick. Either way, our idiot Supreme Court, even a beer bro and the other rapey dude. Yeah, I know, right? Like there's, there's more than one rapey dude on the Supreme Court. Um, either way, even and trad wife. Yes, <laughs> fucking beer bro, the other rapey dude, and trad wife. Um, we didn't elect them, Wither. No, those aren't elected representatives. <laughs> oh, wait. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, the Supreme Court sided with Thompson 6-3. So many rapey dudes. Um, the vote was 6-3. They decided that he, um, did not have to do, uh, uh, he did not have to show an affirmative indication of innocence for, to, uh, to prove malicious prosecution. Um, here's the crazy shit. You want to know who the, the majority was? The six, the six against the three? John Roberts, Brett Kavanaugh, and Amy Coney Barrett joined the other three liberal judges in this decision. Yeah, this is, this is actually an across-the-aisle fucking decision. Both sides were like, no, that's not how this works. So, beer bro... Beer Bro wrote the majority opinion. He declared, um, he, 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 in his written opinion, he declared that a plaintiff need only show that the prosecution ended without a conviction and that Thompson did that. This is, according to Georgetown law professor, Mary McCord, dude, she straight up said, this is a welcome development. This allows police and prosecutors to be held accountable for when they do something wrong. This is, this is a big deal. This is actually a huge fucking deal for us that uh, like we can start suing prosecutors and cops for these these malicious prosecutions when they drop all these charges like we pointed out earlier with the previous one that they they just fucking drop the charges and all of a sudden you're like that is now equivalent to an uh, to an affirmation of innocence. That's, that's an, uh, that is equivalent Supreme Court decision. That is an uh, equivalent to an affirmation of, um, uh, of uh, an affirmative indication of innocence. 
And so if you can show that you were kept in fucking county for two months and blah, 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 they're fucked. You can actually sue now. That will bypass night, punk. What good cops? The good cops get run out and they get killed or threatened or raped or run out of town or state or country in some instances. What, what good cops? There's literal movies about this. Even Hollywood has made movies about this. So fucking Serpico even talked about this. Like, Jesus Christ, there are no good cops. They get run out. So this is a big fucking deal. Like, the Thompson v. Clark decision um, is a... This could change the, the, the landscape a little bit. Not every case, not all cases... But some of them, especially when they do those uh, trumped up bullshit fucking uh, um, counts. So. No, no, you're participating in a system of coercion, oppression and corruption that is uh, designed to maintain the status quo of a ruling class. They are fundamentally class traders at a base level. They were born of labor breaking and slave patrols. There is an unbroken chain between that origin in this country and today's modern policing. They are over militarized. They're purposely trained to be a hyper aggressive, violent and escalatory, uh, escalatory agents within that system. They are still used to disrupt labor practices, uh, marginalized communities, uh, people of color activities, that sort of thing. They're useful infiltration in, uh, in leftist organizations and in general, no, no, there is, there's, no. It's about a systemic issue. And they're coddled authority junkies, yes. Yeah, um, I have done, I have done so much writing and essay and segment work on the origins of and problems with modern policing, um, how we still have legal codified slavery, how the police are an agent of that system, how they are born of union breaking and slave patrols, and none of that has ever changed, how they are agents of a system that attempt to disrupt anti-war activities and the black community. Um, no, no, they're not. No. That's, that's like a, a good a good cell trapped within a cancer of cluster, a, a cluster of cancer. Um, you're like, but there's a good cell in there. Don't worry. It will be cancer soon too. That's just the way it works. Oh yeah, they're very much taught predator to prey mindset. Again, we've done this, we've covered this so many times. Go, you can go watch my YouTube channel, The Origins of and Problem with Modern Policing. Um, you can go watch um, a fucking uh, my um, how to um, police officer fatalities or how to control a populace using lies and force. You can look at the tent poles essay I've done. I've, t I've covered this so many fucking times. No, not for a second. Um, it's actually born of England. Um, but I will show you, uh, police in any location, uh, on the planet are class traders. Yeah. I'll, I'll show you any, you pull, pull a country for example, and we'll, we'll pull up police abuses. We'll show how a hierarchical organization that has a monopolization of force, uh, granted to them by the state is ripe for corruption and abuse. Take your pick. It's a fundamentally flawed uh, um, agency on a global scale. Anyway, so next up. Nebraska. Oh, hang on. Let's just start doing them. <clears throat> Nebraska police officer charged with sexual child sexual assault. Nebraska uh, police officer accused of stealing guns. Let's see, yeah, fucking, oh, more, more sexual assault, more child sexual assault, more, oh, murder with a fucking car, um, oh, a, a tryst, <laughs> that was rape of uh, prisoners in a jail, uh, this is Nebraska, by the way, DRXP, um, yes, it doesn't matter what location you find yourself in, anyway, oh, do we have the video? I need the video of this one because I had the video. Let's see. Uh, cop watch. Let's 
been a minute. It'd be before that. Um, hmm. Okay, I don't have it. Interesting. Oh, I'm being tagged somewhere. Interesting. Thank you, Cupcake. Thank you, Cupcake, as always. Anyway, so, um, ah, yes. Wait, there's the recording. Got it. Ah, yes, this was, okay. Done. That's why I didn't have it, because it's on Facebook, and Facebook is utter garbage. You will. All right, so. So, in Tennessee, a police officer, um, <clears throat> College Dale police officer, gentleman by the name of Evan Driscoll. We'll be seeing him shortly. Evan Driscoll pulled over uh, another um, man just trying to go about his day and work uh, as a DoorDash driver. He's just delivering food for bougie clientele. That's all he's doing. Now, Officer Driscoll claims that on his arrest record, the man, uh, uh, Mr. Gordon, became argumentative while denying he was speeding, refused to hand over his identifying information, demanding to see a supervisor, and staying in his car when ordered out. The driver, who is facing charges of speeding, resisting arrest, and disorderly conduct based on the officer's sworn affidavit, pressed record on his phone after he was pulled over. The recording, well. Get he out. said he pulled me over for a traffic Get stop out. and he's going to taste me. You can't do that, officer, because I call for your Get supervisor. Out. I have my Get license. Out. What is the you reason I'm getting to give your information. I, told you I didn't you refuse. I asked now you're resisting. I you're refusing to give your information. Anybody want to? Um, <clears throat> I have not refused. I asked to speak to your supervisor. Get out. <clears throat> Sir, I feel get uncomfortable. Out. Please get your supervisor. I don't give a shit. Please what don't you touch feel like. me. I said get out. Please stop it. Why are you being like this? Is this is how y'all really are? Please stop. Uh, this get is out. all on tape. Please stop. Get out of the car. Please don't hurt me. Why are get you doing out. this? No, sir. I'm telling you, get out. I'm, I'm telling you that this is not lawful. Ah. Oh my God, get that's out. not lawful, get sir. Get out. That's not lawful. So the entire thing is predicated upon the fact that he refused to give his information even though he had his information clearly in his hand. He had his driver's license in his hand. He would have given it to him. But the fact of the matter is the officer is so out of fucking check already and so ridiculous that he asked to speak to a supervisor, which, by the way, is a perfectly legal and acceptable thing to do with an officer in the field. They are instructed to back off, maintain distance, and ensure that you cannot flee the scene. That is it while waiting for a supervisor. So he asked to speak to his supervisor. He had his ID at the ready. The officer refused to take it. All cops are idiots, man. We screen them by IQ. New York even had a lawsuit about it. If you're too smart, you don't get to be a cop. That's literally a screener in this country. All cops are idiots. They're all dummies. If you ask too many questions, they don't want you. Yeah. Welcome to the U.S. policing system. Dude had to sue over that shit. Oh, so he... um. <clears throat> Obedient class traitors. Yep. So, you know, he swore in an affidavit that, in fact, what had occurred was X, and then video evidence was released of Y. Imagine that. A cop lying on an affidavit, on an arrest record. Who would have thought that's a thing? Oh, wait. 
They all do that. They all do that. At some point in their career, every cop will lie on an arrest record. So, this happened a minute ago, and this is my this is my favorite from last week that we that we collected. Right, this is this is one of my just absolute favorites. So. Made a video about that, says Carpe. We write the reports, was mentioned. Oh, it's almost like, um, oh, I don't know. He's a narcissistic pathological maniac who has an authority uh, addiction and fundamentally is a violent human being that has been empowered by the state. Huh, interesting. Anyway, so... I love this. I love this video. This video is great. This video shows exactly what's up. So a hotel, uh, a hotel clerk is working the night shift and he is working the front desk and a white patron comes in and starts screaming racial epithets at the black man is completely unruly is starting to knock stuff off of like the desk and stuff like that uh, off of one of the tables and stuff and generally misbehaving in the hotel lobby so the um the hotel clerk does what any upstanding citizen would do in this situation he dialed 911 and he called for police reinforcement that's where things got worse. Tonight, police body camera video reveals a shocking new angle of a hotel brawl in Florida. Back up. Back up. The video released by the Fort Lauderdale Police Department shows officers yelling and pushing a black hotel employee before arresting him, even though that employee, Raymond Rashal, was the one to call the police in the first place. Previously released surveillance footage of the incident at a Best Western shows 28-year-old Rashal working at the lobby desk when a man charges past the front desk barrier towards him. Rashal punches the man, Jason Rabe, multiple times before putting him in a headlock and holds him down while 911 was called. According to the incident report from the police, Rashal said the man refused to leave the hotel. Rashal told CBS's Miami affiliate that he canceled Rabe's stay because Rabe, who is white, was making racial slurs towards him. We reached out to Rashal for comment but have not heard back. In the incident report obtained by NBC News, when police responded to the scene, Rashal was hostile and refused to back up. The officer reporting he pushed Rashal back before Rashal, quote, placed his hands on my upper torso and pushed me. It does not appear Rashal pushed the officer from the footage reviewed by NBC News. And you didn't help nothing. Back up, back up. Rashal was taken into custody. Oh, look! And with More lying cops, everyone! Officer with violence. Only in another state this drop. time. The incident report also states the guest, Jason Rabe of New York, was, quote, obviously drunk, uneasy on his feet, and slurring his words. Um, um. <clears throat> Racist, violent, white man, still wandering around. But calm and tried to explain that Rashal had canceled his reservation. Surveillance video shows police escorting Rabe out of the hotel. The incident reports saying he was cited for trespassing before getting a courtesy ride to a friend's house. So, do we still have our bootlickers here? <laughs> so again, someone attempting to do the legal, proper procedure engages with the police and finds himself literally abused, beaten and arrested and then falsely charged by the police and the system supports it. And oh, by the way, what happened? Then the racist, violent white dude got a courtesy ride home. So, want to defend this one now? Would you would you like to defend this one as well? Yes, it is, Gus. It really is. Oh wait, is that um, which one is that that said that? 
Let's see, that would be, that's the other one. Oh, that's a follower of, oh, Scott and Stick666, and oh, yeah, interesting, interesting. Um, yes, so the police, once again, lied on their paperwork, in their report, charged him wrongfully, um, no, you didn't. You have more guns than you do. Uh, you did after the '96 uh, port uh, port uh, shooting incident, Gus. You actually, you guys actually have more guns now than you did in 1996. Just FYI, um, you didn't get rid of guns. That's just a falsity that fucking Aussies online like to tell other people. It's just not true. Um. Port Arthur. Thank you. Yeah. I always forget the Arthur. I, I fucking, it's always named after a king. No, you have more guns than you had in 1996. Pay attention to the words that are coming in my mouth. I know it's, it sounds weird to you because you got that Aussie dialect shit. You, Australia, have more guns in your country today than you did in 1996 after the Port Arthur incident. We have more guns than everybody. That's not a competition. We'll bury you in our guns. That's not even up for discussion. We have more guns than people in this country. We have more people than you by a long shot. You have more guns now than you did in 96. So... They only understand kangaroo-based metaphors. Ah, can I turn that into a kangaroo-based metaphor? Like Canadians, we like to pretend we don't have any, too. Anyone who believes this is making a serious mistake says Cheshire. Use the emu wars. Here's the report. Would you like the link so you can go read it yourself from the Australia Institute? Because that's all the Sydney Morning Herald was reporting on, was a left-leaning think tank called the Australia Institute that released this study that showed you have more guns than you did in 1996 at the Port Arthur incident. The link is in chat. They just wanted to rub it in your face. And let's see. And um, <clears throat> the gun control expert adjunct per, uh, associate professor Philip Alper from the School of Public Health at the Faculty of Medicine and Health at the Sid, uh, University of Sydney uh, concurs with these facts as well. Australian civilians now own more than 3.5 million registered firearms, an average of four for each licensed gun owner. And uh, the purport, uh, let's see, data indicates that uh, people who already own guns have bought more rather than an increase in new, gun, uh, new owners. You, you didn't get the guns out of the hands of the people who already had them. 
Uh, also, another professor uh, by the uh, name of Joel Negan. N- Negan. Um, he would be head of the School of Public Health. Um, he, as well, has spoken and outlined these numbers uh, as well. Um, there's also a, a, uh, there is a uh, paper published in the New England Journal of Medicine that discusses the point further as well. Um, and that is a joint paper authored between Professor Alpers and Professor uh, Negan. So, yes. <sighs> the rate of firearms per po- uh, per 100 population has risen 1.7%. So can we knock off this bullshit talking point that you're trying to promote and go back to reality? Australia has more fucking guns now than it did after the Port Arthur incident. Anyway. Whoop, there goes gravity. Anyway. Australians, I find, get very, very um, um, uh, emotionally and egoistically involved in it. They seem to they seem to have an identity issue tied up with it. The same way that Americans get tied up in like freedom, like we got freedom in this country. Don't you fucking you goddamn fucking commie German fucking fucks. We got real freedom in this country. If you talk about the gun issue, the Australians get very, very fucking twitchy very quickly when you point out that there's some levels of hypocrisy and bullshit there. Yeah. So, you know, it's not the first time I've experienced that. It's not the first time I've experienced that. They seem to have a, a national identity, or at least some of them do, have, uh, have part of their national identity tied up in it. And so it strikes them personally when you talk about this stuff. Uh, hey, 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 don't talk bad about the commie Germans. So anyway, back to Popo's Bizarre Adventures before we were, t- uh, uh, while we were uh, sliding past, changing back, Tokyo drifting. Um, <sighs> so Hillsboro, um, this is Tampa, it's Tampa Bay Times. So this is Her- Hillsboro. This is Florida. This is Florida. Um. This one, actually, there seems to be um, nationalism. <laughs> this one seems to be the fucking, the cops actually been charged in this one. Shock. Shock, I know. Um, this guy by the name of Deputy Daniel L. Hernandez. Uh, Dale Mabry Highway. This dude was speeding down the fucking highway. And, I mean, he was moving at a clip. When I say he was speeding, he was speeding. It was a 45 mile per hour zone. He was driving 109 miles per hour. No, he wasn't in his cruiser. Okay? He was, yeah, he was, he was moving. He was in his Mustang. He actually, um, yeah, the professors didn't control for those numbers and the population growth. No, they didn't control at all for that. Homie, read the fucking study and then come back. Until then, shut the fuck up. We're trying to do something. The the adults are talking, Gus Face. Feel free, feel free to go sit at the kiddies table until then. No, no. The pair of professors who have studied this from your own University of Sydney had not, not at all controlled for those numbers. You're right. Now move aside and let us finish what we were doing. God, Australia's uh, Aussies are fucking weird about this shit. America is fucked up. We agree. So is Australia. 
pivot harder, move on. Anyway, fucking Aussies just think Australia is perfect. That's all. They're fucking idiots. What are you going to do? It's like all of the Brit- British descendants. We're, we're all fucked up. Only some of them think they're perfect. Anyway, don't you have an aboriginal to go genocide? Even further to, to, the, to this day. Don't you have some sacred lands to go copper mine in? Um, any any 10,000-year-old caves and artifacts you guys want to further pay for the destruction of? Trauma children of the original dysfunctional family. Yeah, 100%. Anyway, back to what we were doing before the Aussie, de- uh, Aussie decided to argue with, oh, I don't know, their own professors. Anyway, um, so... The officer that was driving at 109 miles per hour in a 45 mile per hour zone in his Mustang crashed into the fucking Nissan Murano of a 65 year old driver by the name of Krista Richter. She was killed instantly and her husband was very seriously injured. Um, The police officer uh <clears throat> officer hernandez was um yeah yeah he did yeah but gus i'm an anarchist i didn't give a shit about trump to start with anyway um the police officer was challenging another vehicle to a street race at an intersection he literally pulled up to the fucking uh to the intersection and vroom vroom baby And fucking pull uh, and literally started street racing all the way up to 109 miles per hour where he struck Krista Richter's Richter's vehicle. He, um, but don't worry. Don't worry, guys. He committed vehicular uh, manslaughter while street racing. So let's see what happened to him. He was released from county jail less than an hour after posting a $9,500 bail. He 100% got to walk out of jail one hour after posting $9,200 bail, a $9,500 bail. Yeah. That, that's what happened to him. After killing someone. Yes. After, after maiming somebody and killing someone. Yeah. That's what happened to the cop. He got, he got a slap on the wrist. He'll be, he'll be back. He was, um, he was arrested on charges of vehicular homicide and reckless driving. He was released one hour after for a, on a $9,500 bail. Yeah. That's the treatment that cops get. That's what, that's the treatment that cops get in our system. Is that like, imagine if you or I were street racing and fucking committed vehicular manslaughter, murdered a woman and almost killed her husband while going 109 miles an hour down a main drag. They wouldn't let us out. We'd be doing, we'd be in County caboose. Um, boys will be boys. Yeah. We'd be in County for a while, for a while. Um, continuing the, the, uh, tradition, the pattern, Hey narrator. Um, Oh, good on you narrator. Good luck with it. I hope you fucking get a solid grade continuing the pattern tradition uh, and, uh, the sort of the scheme that we've got going here. Another cop who actually is okay. So he's not actually getting punished, but he's not on the force anymore. And he only put up 10% of that. Yes. Cassie, he only put up 10% of that 9,500 fucking ridiculous. So a um a, a a veteran of like 46 years or some shit like that um it, uh, of the um Illinois um St- uh, Springfield Police Department in Illinois um retired well he's <clears throat> he resigned after what was found um was well all across um his media social media and private messaging was some interesting white supremacist stuff. Let's just put it that way. Um, typical, typical for what you expect. Um, he, um, one of them. Uh, this was this was published by Anonymous Comrades Collective. He got hacked basically. Um, 
if I had one, if I found a genie and I had one wish, the Jews would be a distant memory in 72 years. That's the tip of the iceberg. That's, that's the like shit I could probably say on air without having to worry about TOS uh, infringements. But they, um, they have investigated uh, the, his comments and actions. And well, he was allowed to retire with pension. He's not on the force anymore, but he, um, he's getting a full pension. Um, if you want to see the racist psychopath that was on um, police, J. Uh, J. Verig, police. So, yeah, that's that's our that's our special little officer, Aaron Paul Nichols. They always have three names, don't they? Um, Aaron Paul Nichols. <sighs> this guy. This guy. So, remember two years ago? Yes, behold the master race. Dude, they're always gorgeous, aren't they? They're always... Dude, the master race is always just six-pack abs and fucking ripped fucking biceps. They always look amazing. Like, they could just do a triathlon and then another triathlon and then a marathon. It's amazing the shape that they're in. It's already... It's already gone, Glazy. Um... So... Remember a couple of years ago? Interesting. Yeah, it's gone. Oh, you probably have one of the uh, the the um, plugins installed. Do you have like Better TV or Franker Face installed, Glazy? That that'll hold it. That'll allow you to continue seeing it. So, um, two years ago, you might remember um, a, a California police officer. Again, I mean, you know, just a couple of bad apples. Um, So there was a there was a uh, a Rancho Cordova police officer um, who, by the name of um, um, Brian Fowle, um, he well he was caught doing this. Remember when he um, tackled, straddled, and beat um, a uh, a fourteen year old boy for the suspicion of selling tobacco the suspicion of selling tobacco that's that's what happened here he suspected the 14 year old boy so you know he of course jumped on him slammed his head uh, into the fucking the ground as you can see fucking took him down on the curb by the way and then moved him over to the dirt and fucking smushed his face into the goddamn like you know gravel and shit and worked him over uh, he flipped him onto his uh, stomach so he could be handcuffed after he fucking puts his face down in the ground and holds him there he punches him three times once in the chest two in the stomach before forcefully flipping him over again So, why am I talking about a story from two years ago involving the <clears throat> officer uh, Brian Fowl, where he beat a 14-year-old boy for the suspicion of selling tobacco? Because he um, appealed his termination and he's been reinstated by an independent judge within the department ruling that his firing wasn't warranted. They gave him his job back. They gave him his job back. That's why we're talking about good old Brian Fowle here is after he tackled a fucking 14-year-old to the ground, fucking smushed his face in the fucking ground, punched him in the chest and stomach a couple few times. He just, the department, the independent judge, the arbitrator for the department, decided that his, his termination wasn't warranted and they gave him his fucking job back. So, yeah. Yeah, I know, Wither, independent. It's fucking air quotes central. It's 
air, air quote central. 100%. So, yeah. Uh, nope. Okay, so. Back in 2020, there was um, some protests. You might have heard about them. A small, a small thing. It was a blip on the news. It was a blip on the news. Um, something to do with somebody's lives. I forget. Either way, somebody's lives were determined to have mattered. And apparently a couple of people got a little, a little riled up about it. Um, so some, some people apparently were in the street and they had a thing or two to say about maybe the police's treatment of marginalized communities as a whole across this country. <clears throat> well, this is a picture of the Denver police department using a 40 mil, uh, grenade launcher and, um, and various pepper, uh, pepper ball and pepper spray gear. So this, this instance is in Denver, a federal jury, has awarded $14 million to protesters hit with pepper balls and a bag filled with lead, a.k.a. a bean bag, by the way. If you're ever wondering what's in a bean bag, it's, fucking a, it's a canvas bag filled with lead shot. Um, during those 2020 BLM George Floyd demonstrations. Okay? So, the jury, federal jury, the federal jury found that the police did in fact use excessive force against the protesters. They did in fact violate their constitutional rights and ordered the city of Denver to pay the 12 people who sued them. Oh yeah, because this didn't happen in any other state stock market. You're, you argue in bad faith. You're full of shit, man. This didn't happen in any other state whatsoever. Whatsoever. Um, so yeah, this, this is, there are 29 nation, uh, national lawsuits pending, uh, challenging law enforcement use of force during the 2020 protests. And this is the first in the sort of line and a federal jury, a federal court and jury found that in fact, the Denver police did use excessive force by simply using pepper balls and a bean bag. No, I've been all over red states. Is do you think Georgia and Florida are blue states? And Nebraska? Wow, you're 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 a smart one. Anyway, this sets a precedent. Yes, the entire South is super duper blue. Super duper blue. Ah, there we go. Louisiana, Georgia, Florida. Let's see. Fred Fredericksburg. Oh, let's see. Fucking that's Canada. Ah, uh, fucking do 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 do. Uh, let's see. That is Macon County. I always forget where they are. Georgia as well. Um. Anyway, all right. Let me drop my list. <laughs> so. I'm going to go with, I'm going to go with troll based on the fact that he's got to follow to, um, Scott, it's 
Scott teaches his people, the people that listen to him, how to argue in bad faith. So it doesn't surprise me that he's arguing in bad faith. <laughs> Porque no los, do, no los dos. Anyway, so federal, jur, ju, uh, federal jury has just created case, uh, ca created a precedent for, in fact, finding that the outcome of the 2020 protests, uh, 2020 protests was a series of excessive force escalation incidents on the part of police departments nationwide. Um, there are multiple law professors that have spoken about this one. The professor, uh, professor of law at University of Michigan, St uh, uh, Michael Steinberg, um, he's the director of civil rights uh, litigation initiative. He, um, yeah, plus the screen name gives it away. Um, he, he has straight said that it, it g would give cities incentive to settle similar cases rather than list, risk going to trial and losing at this point. He, you know, yeah, quote, there's no doubt that the large jury verdict in Denver will influence the outcome of pending police misconduct cases brought by Black Lives Matter protests across the country. Um, he has law students of his own that are working on a variety of these cases as well. Um, so, yeah, fun, fun, fun. Um, oops. There you go. Aren't these two happy looking men? Oh, I think imaginary points me, Ted. Um, so I told you he was, I told you he was a problem. I fucking told you it was a problem. <laughs> I fucking, anyway. So. Yes. So who are these gentlemen? Who are these fine, clean cut, upstanding citizens of our fine nation? Yes. The pinnacle of the master race. Yes. 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 So. What you have is on the left, you have a gentleman by the name of Brent Getz. He was uh, <clears throat> known as police chief Brent Getz. Yes, he was a chief of police for a s relatively small, uh, small town. The gentleman on the right would be his co-defendant, uh, uh, an uh, a upstanding individual by the name of Gregory Wagner. Um, he test he pleaded guilty and agreed to testify against Mr. Getz here on the left. They will both be sentenced at a later date, but um, the former chief of police and his friend here, well, how do I put this? Um, They raped a six-year-old for about a decade. I shoot them, stock market. I shoot them. Um, yeah, if somebody breaks into my house, that's a violation of my safety. I put them down. I shoot to incapacitate until I no longer feel threatened. That's the answer. Um, when seconds matter, police are minutes away. With what? He doesn't know who I am. That's hilarious. Anyway, so I'm going to stop talking to the idiot at this point. <clears throat> With what? <laughs> You're adorable. Uh, yes, these two individuals, the uh, chief of police there on the left, and his best buddy rape, started raping a girl... Um, at the age of six and continued raping her for a decade. Maybe they were some of the good ones. Are those, are those the good ap apples? Is that is that the good apples that we're we're supposed to be keeping an eye out for? Anyway, <sighs> oh, 
homie, you don't know them like I know them. Let's just put it that way. You don't. It's okay, though. Not everybody grows up with a stepfather who is a federal uh, federal firearms dealer who grew up with what would then become the regional director of the uh, BATFE, right? Not everybody's had tours of the ATF lockups. Not everybody's pa uh, parents owned multiple firearms training facilities. Not everybody's parent, uh, mother was tapped for the Olympic shooting team. Not everybody grew up teaching firearms classes. Not everybody grew up training with, uh, with military individuals. Not everybody grew up going to front side and learning from like Ignatius Piazza, right? Not everybody has that experience. I understand that, but I did. <laughs> Homie, my firearms experience is ridiculous. I grew up with a degree in access to firearms that most people can't even begin to comprehend. And I still continue to have it. The, the familial collection is massive. So, yeah. What would I use? Any of a plethora. My personal preference is a SIG 226, P226 technically, with, an, uh, with a double stack extended magazine. And I prefer the rubber grips to the, uh, the plastic grips that come on it, but that's neither here nor there. I really like my Mossberg shotgun, frankly, um, for home defense, but, you know, it is what it is. <laughs> Even Mark's was in favor of firearms ownership. Any attempt to uh, surrender f uh, uh, firearms or ammunition should be frustrated by force if necessary. Right? That's Karl Marx, man. Anarchists are fucking have never been about gun control. Not once have we ever been on the side of gun control. <laughs> so, homie, you're in the wrong room. You don't even know what the fuck you're doing. You don't know where you are. You don't know what you're talking about. And just because you have a little bit of land, and by the way, it is a little bit of land. I grew up with a mountain as my property and own many acres elsewhere. Right? Like you're not, homie, you don't, I don't want to dick measure with you. I don't want to dick measure with you. But the fact of the matter is if you want to whip out your dick and put it on the table when it comes to firearms, homie. I'm fucking porn star up here and you're just some, well, Donald Trump ding dong fucking mush toad from fucking, uh, fucking super Mario brothers looking motherfucker. All right. Don't, I don't want to do this to you. I don't want to do this to you, but you want to do this. So let's do this. <sighs> he is glazy. He is. <laughs> Yeah, whether an AK-47 is essentially the easiest platform. It's the easiest platform. You could teach a 12-year-old to field strip that, clean it, and reassemble it probably within an hour. It's an astounding platform. Super simple. You can stamp the parts, um, meaning you just cut them out with a, a metal stamp. It's ridiculous. Yeah, an AK is probably your most reliable and easiest to produce platform. 100%. So... While we're on this, while we're on this topic, I have a story. The three-judge panel. Oh, did he go silent now? Hmm, interesting. Um, how many did he say I want to dick measure? Um, a, the three-judge panel that makes up the Fourth Circuit Court of Appeals has published an opinion. In the, oh, you timed him out? Oh, I wanted him. I wanted to fucking, I wanted to play with him more. Oh. I'm going to untime him out and I'll get you your fucking points back. I wanted to play with him. I was right in the middle of smacking him down and you fucking took my play toy away. There we go. So I'll get you your points back. Anyway, the three judge panel um, 
for the Fourth Circuit Court of Appeals published an opinion in the case of Nibs versus Momfart. You do realize that was a community fucking one stock market. By the way, stock market, address what I said to you. You know what? Stock market, come on the air. Anyway, they published an opinion in the case of Nibs versus Momfard. Now, why is the, the case of Nibs versus Momfard so important? What does that have to do with firearm ownership even? What is this apropos of, Kai? Because you were alluding to some level of connectivity between these statements. Well, <clears throat> They found for the estate of Nibs, which was suing Deputy Momford of the Macon County Sheriff's Department. Here's what happened. Here is the long and short of it. Here is the, the opinion as published by the Fourth Circuit Court of Appeals. The mere possession of a firearm by a homeowner is not sufficient to justify the use of deadly force by officers. Let me repeat that, Americans. The Fourth Circuit Court of Appeals has, re has rendered an opinion that states the mere possession of a firearm by a homeowner is not sufficient to justify use of deadly force by officers. Second, there is a right to come to the door with a firearm. Third, officers must identify themselves as officers to qualify for qualified immunity. No knock warrants. Four, mere verbal announcements without visual confirmation is not sufficient to identify oneself. So just because an officer comes to your door and, net, and bangs on the door and says, police, open up, doesn't mean they have sufficiently identified themselves. And if you open the door to gain visual identification, holding a firearm at the ready, that is not just cause for them. Five, sufficient precedent exists for officers to be aware of their duty in these situations. These five points in this opinion are kind of ground changing. This is kind of landscape shifting in a way. This is the fourth circuit straight up saying that, yep, mere possession of a firearm isn't justification for deadly force by officers. You have a right to come to your door armed. They must identify themselves and vo vocal identification alone is not, uh, does not rise to the, uh, to the legal merit of identifying yourself as an officer and qualified immunity does not come into play because sufficient precedent exists for them to be aware because qualified immunity as we've covered before hinges upon these stupid fucking clauses about whether a uh, pr sufficient precedent exists in the violation of a civil rights infraction, et cetera, et cetera. Right. They have ruled that sufficient precedent exists. So this is a big fucking deal. As far as rulings go, it's a big fucking deal. As far as rulings go in this country, this one's going to find its way to the Supreme court. This one's, this one's going to find its way to the Supreme Court. Count on that. Look for Nibs ver, uh, versus Momford in a few years in the Supreme Court. That's making its way. There's no fucking way this doesn't make its way to the Supreme Court. Yeah. Um, Rev, a lot of states do. <coughs> this kind of thing could prevent a future Breonna Taylor? Yeah, it can. Oh, yeah, cops. The entire legal establishment is going to fight this. Yes, he ran away as soon as I asked him to come on air, I believe. He, he hasn't said shit, so, you know, yeah. Um, so, <clears throat> he 
here's the NYPD van that slammed into a homeless man who was begging for change on a Brooklyn street Thursday night last week, of course, because we do the following week or the previous week. This is, this is, this is the, um, <clears throat> the gruesome part. Um, they hit him and then drug him an additional 35 feet before they stopped. So, yeah. Yeah. Glazy, because our news cycle is fucked. You know that. It's, it's our news cycle is fucked. Um, and, you know, bigger stories, right, man? Bigger stories. There's glitzier stories. Fucking Ukraine and fucking Biden and Fox News and Donald Trump and all that other shit, right? <clears throat> fucking the media sucks. The news cycle sucks. The country sucks, right? Um, Are they playing the victim now? Of course they are. Yeah. They struck him at pretty, pretty fast speed. He's, he's dead, by the way. The, the homeless man died. Um, yeah. Oh, yeah. I, Axel, I mean, there's an argument to be made there as well. We covered last week when they were in Williamsboro. Williamsburg, sorry, Williamsburg, uh, cleaning up the homeless encampment under the uh, Williamsburg Bridge, um, and it was ten, it was ten degrees out when they were doing it. Yeah, so yeah, uh, Exol was saying, in my opinion, the reason why this isn't reported is because of the mayor doing anti-homeless and pro-cop stuff, and his financial backers have some good control over the media. Um, they probably still charged him. Um, no, Glazy, no, not at all. No, no, that was somebody else a long time ago. No, <laughs> no, not what's what's so, no. Um, Carpe, they probably still charged him with damaging the van. Dude, they probably handcuffed him. They probably fucking handcuffed him. I'm not kidding you. That's the shit cops do. They do it all the time. They're absolute garbage human beings. Um, oh, just fuck PD. That's just, you know, f f drop the NY and just fuck PD. <laughs> That's, yeah. Um, Let's go to Toronto. Um, I don't have a I don't have a picture. Sorry, I don't have a picture. Um, hey, it's been a while since I played this one. Um, hold on, where is it? Jesus Christ! Fuck the police! Fuck the police! Fuck the police! Um, man knew what he was saying. Narrator, oh no, not near me. Yeah, um, a Brampton teenager. Um, who was an aspiring rapper, a young black man, um, was fucking uh, confronted by the Special Investigations Unit of the Toronto Police Department. Over, wait for it, wait for it, wait for it, the alleged sale of counterfeit watches. Oh, interesting. The police were protecting the interests of the capitalist class? I'm shocked. I really am. I'm shocked, guys. The police. Did you know? Did you know, guys? The police occasionally protect the interests of the capitalist class. This was a new one on me, so I, I was, I was shocked to hear this. Mm, yes. Anyway, um, the Brampton teenager was pursued and tackled to the ground. Um, over the alleged sale of counterfeit watches. And then of course, you know, given a little <clears throat> roughing up, shall we say, um, the police of course wouldn't release any footage or his name or any of that sort of stuff. Um, but the kid's dead. All right, dig, take care of yourself. Good luck on your side of town. I just thought they didn't solve murders. Murders. Oh, Ducky. No, Ducky. Um, they also don't solve rapes as well. Um, so we don't know. 
I, I will I will literally lead you the quote. It remains unclear what actually caused his death, but the officers involved are facing disciplinary charges for uh, uh, for uh, for failing to notify police about their use of force and failing to document their interaction with him. So the police had a violent interaction with a young man who was potentially selling counterfeit watches. And then he turns up dead and none of their paperwork ever says anything about interacting with him whatsoever. I mean, maybe they didn't have anything to do with it. Maybe they're perfectly innocent. Maybe they just, you know, roughed him up a little bit and let him go and some other incident occurred. But covering up your tracks like that and then the kid turning up dead a couple hours later doesn't, um, it doesn't inspire confidence in your story. Let's just put it that way. Um, so, yeah, we don't know yet. Get on the air. I've already talked about a bunch of red states, dummy. We went through a whole bunch of southern states. We went through Arizona. We went through fucking Georgia. We went through Tennessee. We went through Louisiana. We went through fucking, I mean, Jesus Christ, man. We've been all over this fucking country in this session. We've been going for two and a half. We've been going for two hours now doing police stories. Get on the air. I'll have the fucking conversation with you. Otherwise, you know, stop being a cowardly little bitch. Oh, here's another fucking, let's do another Louisiana story. Fucking, oh, let's see a deputy shooting. Oh, that's always great. Oh, that's, that's fun. This is fun. Um, for those keeping track of what you can um, get shot for, um, like, you know, driving while black, walking while black, standing while black, drinking iced tea while black, studying while black. Um, let's do Louisiana, right? Um, this is an interesting way to get shot. Um, 19-year-old dr uh, driver and a 20-year-old passenger. The vehicle was found off uh, in a marsh, partially submerged all over Delta, all over. Um, it was the vehicle, um, <clears throat> 911 call came in reporting that a vehicle had run off the highway and was partially submerged. The deputies found the vehicle in the marsh off the Interstate 10 off-ramp from U.S. Highway 51, partially submerged. During the encounter, the police, sh this is quote, quote, during an encounter with the two occupants, a deputy shot Williams once, the state police said without elaborating. It is an active, in is Louisiana not a red state? Is Louisiana? Never mind. I'm I'm done interacting with that. Praxis's theory put into action and then refined upon. What ex what do you want as my praxis? What statement? We'll deal with it in a second. No one time him out. Anyway, let me wrap up a few of these and then we'll we'll get to dealing with people anyway so if you're wondering another interesting way to get um to get yourself shot while being a uh, tenuous strenu uh, even you know tenuously brown um that's that's great so you know drowning in your own car after it's left the highway in a car accident Let me point out something. I'm in the middle of a fucking segment. Thank, please and thank you. I'm trying to get through a bunch of stories. Thank you. Trying to actually do some fucking coverage here and get a fucking segment done. And I've got multiple people over here that don't understand what we're attempting to do right now. 
I'm in the middle of a segment we do repeatedly called Popo's Bizarre Adventures, where I document and track the malfeasances of, pol uh, malfeasances of police, mostly in the American nation, but also abroad. And I've got four more fucking tabs to get through. And then we can do some other stuff. Please and thank you. So anyway, those keeping track and adding to the tally list of ways to get yourself shot by the police, drowning in your own car, add that to the list. That would be Louisiana, the notoriously deep blue state of Louisiana, according to one of our brilliant participants in chat. Um, anyway, Amir Locke. Yes, Glazy, he called Louisiana blue. He also called, I believe, Arkansas, um, uh, Georgia. Um, he called a bunch of states, it was southern states blue. Yes, yes, he's a he's brilliant individual. Um, yeah, so anyway, Amir Locke, <clears throat> the uh, early morning no-knock warrant um, where they broke into um, his cousin's apartment where he was staying uh, without knocking, without fucking identifying themselves as a part of an investigation into a homicide in a neighboring city, um, there will be no charges filed. There will be no charges filed. Um, this ruling, this decision comes on the heels of that Fourth Circuit Court decision. So moving forward, we may actually find that these sorts of decisions get a little um, by maniac to care. These sorts of decisions may get challenged under that, uh, that, uh, that uh, precedent. So that's definitely going to be a fascinating thing moving forward. I expected this. I expect this always, frankly. Um, do I have that picture? Yes, I do. Um, and if you guys remember, um, Glazy, you're a northerner. Um, the Buffalo, New York police officers who um, shoved the uh, old man to the ground while they were out doing their jackbooted thuggery and cracked his skull on the ground. <clears throat> well, the arbitrator ruled that the two police officers didn't violate the department's use of force guidelines. Um, quote, uh, well, first, the police tried to claim he um, tripped and injured himself. They first tried to lie, as all police try to lie. Um, they tried to lie and cover their tracks, but when it came, when the footage of them knocking him over and cracking his skull on the fucking ground like that came out and they couldn't lie about it anymore, um, what happened is the uh, it went to arbitration and the arbiter decided, uh, his name is Jeffrey uh, Selchik, by the way, that's the arbiter, his name is fully published in international media. He wrote, quote, Upon review, there is no evidence to sustain any claim that respondents, the police officers, had any other viable options other than to move Gugino out of the way of their forward movement. They had no other option than to shove the 75-year-old man to the ground, cracking his skull on the concrete. No other option, guys. None. They could not move to the left. They could not step around him in any way, shape, or form. They had to shove him to the ground. That's the only option they had. So if you want to add to the list of people who are also considered cops within the ACAB umbrella, any arbitra uh, arbiter that works within the department, yeah. <clears throat> and here's another fun one.
Here's Frederick, Fredericksburg, Washington. They couldn't shove the public art installation. They had to shove something. So, so this is the body camera uh, footage from an officer, Sean Jurgens. Get out of the car or I'm going to fucking smoke you. That's the point. Get I'll, out. I'll point out Don't what needs pointed out when this is done. Trinity player is activated. Uh, just so everybody knows, this is also happening. Um, yeah, yeah, Glaze, I'll get you the link. Just so you know, this uh, this is happening in a very infamously deep blue state, um, Virginia. Virginia, Fredericksburg, Virginia. Um, de notoriously deep blue state, by the way. Um, that's definitely what's going on. Oh, did the little fucking punk bitch leave? He fucking left. Of course he left. Um, yes. Oh my god, stop it, stop it, stop it, stop it! Now they're running him over with his car. His foot's on Yeah, you're good. Stop it. Okay. So what happened? Well, the city of Fredericksburg, Virginia is paying this man $5 million. That's what's happening. He was having a stroke. Yes. Caboose is right. He was having a stroke. That man was having a stroke. He was literally sitting in traffic and began having a stroke. And the cops rolled up and fucking tased him, pepper sprayed him, and then ran him over with his own fucking car. Not the first stroke victim we've covered this year either, by the way. Not the first stroke victim we've covered this year, by the way. That's the second stroke victim we've covered this year. Where somebody was having a stroke in traffic and the cops fucking arrested him. So, you know. That. So the, um, the case just was awarded $5 million. 
Yeah. Of taxpayer money, as always. Not coming out of the police benevolent fund. Not coming out of their pensions. It's not coming out of their budget. Um, so, yeah. That's, that's what we're dealing with. So, Popo's Bizarre Adventures, everyone. That one went for about two hours and 20 minutes, I think. Something like that. Exactly. Screw you, taxpayer. Well, now that the coward has run away... I mean, I love that you fucking have an air of superiority about you, Gus Face. The only difference between your country and ours is you have health care. That's it. Your police are just as abusive. You have the same genocide. You probably have even more of a racial problem because nobody pays attention to you guys. You guys get away with just continually still ostracizing and murdering black people um, or aboriginal people. Like... It is. Oh, that's that's. Uh, I love the misogyny, though. Little girls. I'll insult you directly. I don't need to. It, uh, I don't need to denigrate an entire you know half of our species to do it. <laughs> yeah, and Nazis. Yeah. I love the, the the nationalistic air of superiority. Just because you belong to a tribe that you perceive to be better than like y'all motherfuckers don't have issues <laughs> that are the same as ours. Didn't y'all just have a case of a bunch of cops raping some fucking Aboriginal kids or some shit like that too. I was reading about the other day. I thought it was Canada, Australia, same difference. Yeah, it's the same thing. The end of the day. Land back. Land back. Come on the air then, man. Come on the air. Expand my mind. I'm I'll critique Australia, America, Russia, China. I'll critique them all. You are attached nationalistically to the concept of Australia. And I find that amusing that you've given into that nationalistic fervor. Come on the air and talk. Stop being a keyboard warrior and actually get on the air. Speak your mind. Stand up for your beliefs. Engage in the dialectical exercise. Explore your rhetorical devices. Exercise them. Australia is the one that ships refugees in an island concentration camp. They are. That's right. What's the fucking island called? Australian island concentration camp. What is that? What, what island is that? Torrens Island concentration camp. It's got its own Wikipedia page. Torrens Island Concentration Camp. Holy shit, man. Started as a World War I concentration camp. <clears throat> uh, no, this may be a different one. Hang on. Um, 
Oh, they've got a bunch of them. Never mind. They've got a bunch of uh, they've got a bunch of concentration camps. Did you know Australia has multiple concentration camps? Fascinating. Manus Island and uh, the uh, Nauru concentration camps are described as hell holes. Hmm. Interesting. It is um, it is where they keep their um, refugees. That's that's where they keep their political refugees and people attempting to escape other horrid locations. So let's see. They keep one thousand seven hundred and eighty six people at last count imprisoned on the two islands workers uh, are responsible for shedding some light on the conditions there uh, by the way quote there's not enough space for the kids to run around in we can't take them to the park the beach nowhere families of five live in one area little area of a large marquee divided only by clear tarp tarpaulins so there is no privacy husbands and wives are not allowed to have sex they can't do anything without everyone knowing their business there is a men's and women's camp. In the men's camp, there are three or four toilets working at any given time for 350 men. They are soiling themselves and then have to wait in line for hours to have a two-minute shower. Um, another worker from the male-only Manus Island camp said, As time goes by, the men are getting more desperate and more sick. They all complain about kidney pain, headache, insomnia, but it takes at least three weeks to see a doctor for a client. The abuses of human dignity are so bad in Australia's offshore concentration camps that one senior executive of a chari charity contracted to provide services confided, quote, I wake up in the middle of the night in a cold sweat, worried that one day we may have to face a royal commission and have to answer for the conditions under which these people were treated and which we didn't have the guts to challenge the government on. Interesting. That's fascinating. So maybe drop the air of superiority since your government's been apparently taken over by neo-Nazis. Just seems to me like, you know, America's fucked. But to sit there and attempt to be all high and mighty because you come from a place that has active concentration camp islands that are genociding refugees as we speak. Maybe keep the, the, the holier-than-thou attitude in check. Yeah. Especially coming from a country that has such a long and storied history of genociding people that don't look like you. All the way up to current day. So, were the neo-Nazis there in the beginning, too? Just... Out of quest, just out of curiosity, has it, has it always been neo Nazis? Is that is that what you're going with, or is it just maybe the Australian people like a touch of genocide? Because y'all seem okay with it. Same criticism that goes for America. Same criticism that goes for China. Same criticism that goes for Russia. Same criticism that goes for Western Europe. It seems that there's a there's an amount of genocide that is acceptable. Oh yeah, they were kidnapping kids way up like 1970s, maybe even the 80s. Yeah. Did you know Aboriginal people in Australia were originally classified as fauna by the British colonists? Fascinating narrator. Um Oh, yeah, Rev. I mean, you know, it is. I mean, Squid is one of the stolen generation, and uh, they're, what, in their 40s and know nothing of their indigenous heritage? There you go. Ex-British ex colonies are real bad to that shit. Mm, aren't they, Omicron? Um, maybe these genocides are where they've been getting the adrenochrome. Hey, fuck it. Let's bury it. Yeah. Uh...
Yep. So, oh, Sweden too. Dude, Cheshire. Yeah. I just, you know, I find it interesting when people try and ride a high horse over America just because America, right? America bad. Yeah, America bad. Dude, we suck. We're doing a whole bunch of shit wrong. But where do you think you buy your missiles and guns from? Where do you think you buy all your bullets, bombs, and guns from, Gus? Us. When you need a new whip, uh, missile system to defend yourself against China, you buy it from the U.S. 800, 800 million you just dropped recently on buying missiles from the U.S. We buy them from Nick Cage, right? White people. Am I right? Um... Nick Cage's um, AMA was more uh, was had a higher uh, um, acti uh, activity rate on it than Obama's AMA on Reddit. Nick Cage is more popular on Reddit than fucking Obama. That is amazing. At the height of his shit, Obama did an AMA. Nick Cage just did an AMA, and he got more activity on it than fucking Obama got on his. You just bought You just bought a <laughs> Oh, you're buying a new nuclear submarine and a whole bevy of US built Tomahawk missiles as well from us. Nick Cage is president of the internet. Obama's just president of the USA. It would, Glazy. Dude, Glazy, I agree. It would be fucking hilarious. It'd be amazing. Fucking dive, dive, dive. Dude, that would be fucking, it'd be great. I agree. If you ever get access to a fucking, like, a nuclear sub, Glazy, then you get to drive it. Give me a call. <laughs> Fuck it, dude. Well, I'll even drink a beer with you. And I don't even drink beer, but dude, that's a beer moment, right? Couple of clank, right? The fucking nuclear sub and shit. It'd be fucking amazing. <laughs> fucking what? Get a little buzz on. Maybe start World War Three. You know, is what it is. Fucking. But yeah. I'm not saying we're your only supplier. I'm saying you buy from us all the time. All the time. And France. And Britain. Fucking and Germany. But you give us billions of your dollars to give you weapons of destruction. You help support this empire. Australia helps create the U.S. military industrial complex. You are one of the contributing factors. How is that not part of the discussion? A daily reminder that imperialism is a racket. You are right flank to America, Gus. And most of the world. Yes, exactly, Rounding. Yeah. Y'all help create this. For all of... This is, this is my criticism of everything outside the U.S., Smedley, Smedley Butler, where are you paging Smedley Butler? Here's my criticism. For all of your criticism of the U.S. hegemony and the U.S. military industrial complex and the U.S. foreign military, uh, U.S. foreign policy in general, you pay us billions of dollars to, to run that. You coordinate and cooperate with it. You're just as complicit in it as we are. For all of the evil and ills that, the, that America brings on this world, you as an Australian citizen are guilty as well of that. That's my point. I'm not defending America. I'm not getting into a pissing contest about who spends more or gives. You are complicit in our crimes too.
For everything that you criticize and judge America on, you help support. You help prop up this empire. Your nation state is helping build this nonsense. You help us have bases in that part of the world. Literally, Australia is partially responsible for the U.S. hegemony. It's responsible for the U.S. military industrial complex. There we are. There we are. Yeah. It was, it, it dropped to red for a little bit. We've been having some bitrate issues. Buck the trend friend. How do you define best? My Yemeni friend calls Australia one of the queen states. Um, huge U.S. surveillance base in the center of Oz. Oh, yeah. Dude, the Five Eyes. Dude, Australia is a necessary signals intelligence location for us. Um, they help us spy on the world. Um, Buck the Trend Friend. America the Beautiful with Amber Waves of Grain, Purple Mountains, Majesty Above the Fruited Plains. Bro, America is the best nation there is. How do you define best? Is it infant mortality rate? Is it access to education? Is it happiness index? Is it late life retirement quality of life? Is it, how, how do you define best? Because I would argue that the metrics that matter and count, America is far, far from the top of the list. Freedom to heart failure. <laughs> yeah, exactly. How, how, how do you quantify and qualify best about the trend? Or are you being sarcastic? Because it's difficult to see sarcasm in text. So you have no real numbers. You have no nothing real. You just have a, a, a feeling. You have a feeling. Okay. We are very good at killing black people. Okay. So you have nothing. Got it. You have nothing. That's, that's I mean, you know, n not everybody requires, I suppose, facts or like actual data. Not everybody is an empiricist. Some people are religious and that's okay. If you want to be a uh, uh, religious about your, your faith in America, that's fine. Uh, no, in fact, it isn't buck the trend. We don't actually uh, have the highest immigration rate. It 
most assuredly not per capita and not even in raw number. We aren't. You are incorrect in that statistic as well. Germany, in fact, is the number one destination globally. Applications too. Oh, in Canada, apparently, is getting the tech immigrants, according to that CIC News article. So people don't people want to go to Germany over us. So we're not even number one in the way you want. Delta, nah. It's bad for it's bad for business for oligarchs to start putting other oligarchs in jail. Nah. I don't don't count on it. Don't hold your breath. If it happens, it happens, but do not count on it. No. In this country? Hmm. He's white, he's got a fair b- a clip of cash, and he's tied up in political systems. Nah. Republicans repealed the Clean Water Act. I mean, yeah. Marcus, a few hundred thousand. Um, as of now, as of last counting, Marcus, uh, three hundred and let's call it three hundred thousand difference. Yeah, we'll go with three hundred thousand. It's a little less. About 296, something like that. Um, yeah, so Germany's, Germany's getting more um, citizenship applications. They're getting more migrants across the board. Um, they're getting... do some let's do some per capita math shall we what is the land mass and population of the u.s and the land mass and population of germany now let's do a per capita calculation on that 50 versus 15 shall we so Let's do some math. Oh, math is always fun. Demographics of the US, demographics of Germany. Okay, so let's take your numbers. This will be fun. 50 million immigrant uh, applications for a country that has a total population of 331 million with a land mass of 9.1 million square kilometers compared to a country with a population density, uh, a population of 83 million and a land mass of 350,000 square kilometers. Let's do some just calculations shall we total number total numbers are right now more get into germany than us 
So let's see, what shall it be? Mm, your and your numbers of even numbers is highly suspicious, by the way. Where did you get source these numbers? Where did you source these numbers, you lying little son of a bitch? Fifty million my ass. I'm looking at the USCIS right now. Cause not according to the United States Citizenship and Immigration Services. 50 million my ass. It's not even close to that. You're just making up numbers. You rounded up from 5.7 million to 50 million? I mean, I've heard of some rounding errors, homie, but holy fuck balls. Where'd you get that number? I'm at the fucking US, uh, USCIS right now. Yeah, get the fucking US Citizenship and Immigration Services number, not some fucking wonky ass website. Jesus goddamn Christ. Even if we're being generous, generous and roll in a whole bunch of bottlenecks and backlogs and pending court cases. Oop, wrong, wrong link entirely. DHS Office of Immigration Statistics, Immigration Statistics Status Report, first uh, fiscal year 2022, quarter one. And let's pull the Excel spreadsheet. Holy shit. Yeah, again, world population view is not a fucking valid source when I'm looking at the actual United States Citizenship and Immigration Services data. Like, homie, government data versus some third party website. Worldpopulationview.com, which by the way, oh, this is great. Anybody, hold on, hold on. You're going to love this. You're going to love this. Wait for it. I'll, I'll, I'll put this on screen so you can see it. All right, everybody ready? Here's what happens when I go to this guy's website. So made up number, rounded like while multiplying, like, yeah, no, that, that website literally can't even make it back. Uh, fucking holy shit. This is amazing. You have the worst fucking source ever. We have, in total, backlogged over multiple years, 9.5 million applications as of February of 2022. And those actually cover a span of up to five years worth of data points. 
So that 9.5 million contains numbers that stretch past 2022. This isn't just applications in 2022. This is applications dating back to some of these date back to, according to the U, uh, US, uh, USCIS data, uh, data set, back to 2013. Because the immigration process is long and a, be- a hell of a travail in this country. So the total number of on book immigration applications in this country for almost a decade is 9.5, according to U.S. Uh, fucking uh, Citizenship and Immigration Services themselves. But you've got a sketchy website that nobody can get past ad block with. That says 50 million. Sure. Homie. 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 (sighs) Can I get the total backlog? The average immigration case completed in January 2022, average, had been pending for two and a half years with some courts average wait time, average wait in excess of three years. So that 9.5 million applications that is on the books for first quarter um, 2022 for immigrations, uh, immigration services in the U.S., actually could effectively be divided by three if, uh, if you really wanted to like do some conservative numbers. Fuck it, A. Jesus, goddamn Christ. Fuck it, check your own goddamn sources, people. That was fucking pathetic. Fuck it, and we can't even get to that website. That website won't even fucking load because it's so sketchy as shit. Oh my god, you dumb motherfucker. He's taking the total... He's taking the total amount of immigrants ever... All foreign born immigrants to America. That's what that number is. I just fucking, I turned off everything so I could load this stupid fucking website. That's our total number of foreign born immigrants. And even our our rate of immigrant uh, acceptance is decreasing. Holy shit, it's down 3% per year. And of course, the first, if you do, if you do Google, which don't use Google. Who the fuck uses Google? That's a forecast. Can we sort? Oh my god. Whose numbers were these? This is the UN data. Jesus Christ. So 
like effective numbers, we're down between Afghanistan and Finland. Qatar, Oman, Lebanon, Kuwait, the Maldives, Jordan, Luxembourg, Equatorial Guinea, Macau, Singapore, Saudi Arabia, Gabon, Switzerland, Curacao, Norway, Australia, Iraq, Iraq, Malta, Canada, Bahrain, Austria, the UAE, Italy, Sweden, Germany, Turkey, Belgium, Belize, uh, Guernsey or Jersey, depending on fucking how you feel about that, I suppose. Cyprus, New Zealand, Great Britain, Denmark, South Africa, and Afghanistan, and then the United States. Total migration. Total migration. This is the UN. Let's go World Bank. I mean, World Bank's got a, right? Yeah, there you go. Where are we? 15.94 migrants per 1,000. Whereas Oman is 345.59. Jesus Christ, we're not even close. You never cited sources. Here, now use Google because I'm so rural that GSM physically doesn't uh, exist and Verizon literally will not pass out on lock codes. Uh, thank you very much. Something, something digital divide. Yeah, no, I feel you. I feel you. Um, what source, by the way? Um, oh, you know what? Let me... Uh, all right, so Jesus, that was ah. You specifically said don't use Google links around here. That's it. I specifically don't use Google links around here. Yeah, like why would you? They admitted it was posted in bad faith. Oh, well then fuck off. Let's try the sperm bank. They have good numbers. Hey, <laughs> rounding. Yeah, I know, right? So, hey, dig. So basically you got called out. Glazy, I don't want people who didn't like argue in bad faith like that. Oh, so you got caught out as a fucking idiot. And now you're like, it's a joke, bro. It's just a prank. Grow up, man. Grow up. It's that's kind of just sad. It's just a prank, bro. Hey, another one of the fucking idiot cops that stormed the Capitol is found guilty on all counts. Jesus Christ, fucking morons. I love seeing these guys get their first taste of statism. It's fucking brilliant. Oh, is that what's her name? Oh, what's their name? Charlie. Yes. Oh, isn't that... What was Charlie's previous name? What's Charlie's dead name? Because I remember... Was it Charlene? I think it was Charlene. Anyway, um, Charlie. Charlie Disney. One of the heirs to the Walt Disney Company came out as transgender publicly. If you were wondering... Who's going to fucking win in Florida versus Disney? Put your put your money on fucking Disney. Yeah, I'm over it. Um, where? Oh, it's in pounds. It's got to be in fucking Britland. Uh, Charlie Disney is a hilarious name. It is actually. But when it comes to fucking around and finding out, fuck with Disney and find out. Seriously. Uh, we will fuck. They will. Uh, we, we will. Uh, we will bend this entire nation to the will of Disney. We've done it before.
Hey, Buck the Trend. I don't believe anything you say, and you've already admitted to arguing in bad faith on this channel. So if you put anything inflammatory or bullshit in chat, you're just going to get a timeout from now on. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I only interact with people who act in good faith. So... Scott's people, Scott, it openly admits he teaches his people to argue with others in bad faith. And you can see it when you interact with them. When you come across somebody who has a, Scott, uh, has a Fabian Liberty follow on their account, the first thing you should note is they argue in bad faith. Scott teaches his, follow, his viewers, his fucking weirdo, ethno-nationalist, racist, fascist, piece of shit followers to argue in bad faith. They, he teaches them disruption tactics. Very much akin to what the FBI uses. It's a very similar uh, policy. <clears throat> so, yeah, I don't tolerate it. All right, y'all want to finish up Rules for Radicals? I think we can finish it today. Yeah, I think we can finish it. Doing the feds work for free. Yep. Um, so let us disable this. Let us disable this. Let us disable this. Um, actually, you know what? I'm going to fucking leave Cappy Sub on. There we go. Uh, oh, look, another Scott follower arguing in bad faith. Yeah, let's finish rules for radicals. Um, mods, FYI, if you're here and you're a mod, uh, the alerts are turned off and all of that. But if anybody acts a fool, feel free to just time them out while we're while I'm reading. We're not going to put up with like people disrupting the side while we, you know. <clears throat> all right. The Genesis of Tactic Proxy. The greatest barrier to communication between myself and would-be organizers arises when I try to get across the concept that tactics are not the product of careful cold reason, that they do not follow a, a table of organization or plan of attack. Accident, unpredictable reactions to your own actions, necessity, and improvisation dictate the direction and nature of tactics. Then... Analytical logic is required to appraise where you are, what you can do next, and the risks and hopes that you can look forward to. It is this analysis that protects you from being a blind prisoner of the tactic and the accidents that accompany it. But I cannot overemphasize that the tactic itself comes out of the free flow of action and reaction and requires on the part of the organizer an easy acceptance of apparent disorganization. The organizer goes with the action. His approach may be free, open-ended, curious, sensitive to any opportunities, any handles to grab onto, even though they involve other issues than those they may have in mind at the particular time. The organizer should never feel lost because they have no plot, no timetable, or definite points of reference. A great pragmatist, Abraham Lincoln, told his secretary in the month the war began, My policy is to have no policy. Three years later, in a letter to a Kentucky friend, he confessed plainly, I have been controlled by events. The major problem in trying to communicate this idea is that it is outside the experience of practically everyone who's been exposed to our alleged education system. The products of this system have been trained to emphasize order, logic, rational thought, direction, and purpose. We call it mental discipline, and it results in a structured, static, closed, rigid mental makeup. Even a phrase such as being open-minded becomes just a verbalism. Happenings that cannot be understood at the time or don't fit into the accumulated educational pattern are considered strange, suspect, and to be avoided. For anyone to understand what anyone else is doing, 
they have to have had a, an underst- uh, to understand it in terms of logic, rational decision, decision, and deliberate conscious action. Therefore, when you try to communicate the whys and wherefores of your actions, you are compelled to fabricate these logical, rational, structured reasons to rationalizations. This is not how it is in real life. Since the nature of the development of tactics cannot be described as a general proposition, I shall attempt instead to present a case study of the development of the proxy tactic, one that promises to be a major tactic for many years to come. I shall try to take the reader into my experience with the hope that afterward they will reflect candidly upon the hows and whys of their own tactical experience. We know that we are predominantly a middle-class society living in a corporate economy, an economy that tends to form conglomerates so that in order to, uh, to know where the power lies, you have to find out who owns whom. For some years past, it has been like trying to find the pea in the shell game. But now there are strobe lights flashing for further confusion. The one thing certain is that masses of middle-class Americans are ready to move toward major confrontations with corporate America. College students have argued that their administrations should give student committees the proxies in their stock portfolios for use in the struggle for peace and against pollution, inflation, racially discriminatory policies, and other social ills. Citizens from Baltimore to Los Angeles are organizing proxy groups to pool their votes for action on the social and political policies of their corporations. Feeling the national proxy organization may give them, for the first time, the power to do something, they're now waking to a growing interest in the relationship of their corporate holdings to the Pentagon. The, this pragmatic means towards political action has loosened new forces. Recently, I talked to three students at Stanford's Bus- uh, School of Business Administration about their ways and means of proxy use. I asked them what their major goal was, and they responded, getting out of Vietnam. They shook their heads when I asked whether they had been active on the issue. Why not? I inquired. Their answer was that they didn't believe in the effectiveness of demonstration in the streets and recoiled from such actions as carrying Viet Cong flags, draft card burnings, or draft evasion, but they did believe in the use of proxies. Enter three new recruits. You can depend upon the establishment to radicalize them further. Like any new political program, the proxy tactic was not the result of reason and logic. It was part accident, part necessity, part response to reaction, and part imagination, each part affecting the other. Of course, imagination is also tactical sensitivity. When the accident happens, the imaginative organizer recognizes it and grabs it before it slips by. The various accounts of the history of the development of the proxy tactics show a line of reason, purpose, and order that were never there. The mythology of history is usually so pleasant for the ego of the subject that they accept it in modest silence an affirmation of the validity of the mythology. After a while, they begin to believe it. The further danger of mythology is that it carries the picture of genius at work with the false implication of purposeful logic and planned actions. This makes it more difficult to free oneself from the structured approach. For this, if if no other reason, mythology should be understood for what it is. The history of Chicago's Back of the Yards Council reads, Out from the gutters, the bars, the churches, the labor unions, yes, even the communist and socialist parties, the neighborhood businessmen's associations, the American Legion, and Chicago's Catholic Bishop Bernard Scheel, they all came together on July 14, 1939, July 14, Bastille Day, their Bastille Day, the day they celebrated and symbolically selected to join together to storm the barricades of unemployment, rotten housing, disease, delinquency, and demoralization. That's the way it reads. What really happened is that July 14th was selected because it was the one day the public park field house was clear. The one day that the labor unions had no scheduled meetings. The day that many priests thought was best. The one day that the late Bishop Scheel was free. There wasn't a thought of Bastille Day in in any of our minds. That day, at a press conference before the convention came uh, came to order, a reporter uh, asked me, 
Don't you think it's somewhat too revolutionary to deliberately select Bastille Day for your first convention? I tried to cover my surprise, but I thought, how wonderful, what a windfall. I answered, not at all. It is fitting that we do so, and that's why we did it. I quickly informed all the speakers about Bastille Day, and it became the keynote of nearly every speech. And so history records it as a calculated, planned tactic. The difference between fact and history was brought home when I was a visiting professor at a certain Eastern University. Two candidates there were taking their written examinations for the doctorate in community organization and criminology. I persuaded the president of this college to give me a copy of this examination, and when I answered the questions, the departmental head graded my paper. Knowing only that I was an anonymous friend of the president. Three of the questions were on the philosophy and motivations of Saul Alinsky. I answered two of them incorrectly. I did not know what my philosophy or motivations were, but they did. I remember that when I organized the back of the yards in Chicago. I made many moves more almost intuitively. But when I was asked to explain what I had done and why, I had, I had to come up with reasons. Reasons that were not present at the time. What I did at the time, I did because that was the thing to do. It was the best thing to do, or it was the only thing to do. However, when pressed for reasons, I had to start considering an intellectual scaffold for my past actions. Really, rationalizations. I can remember the reasons being so convincing even to myself that I thought, why, of course I did it for those reasons. I should have known that was why I did it. Uh, fucking the proxy tactic was born in Rochester, New York, in the conflict between Eastman Kodak and the black ghetto organization called Fight. Our foundation had helped to organize. The issues of the conflict are not relevant to the present subject, except that a vice president of Kodak assigned to negotiate with Fight reached an agreement with Fight, and that seemed to close the matter. Enter the first accident. For Kodak, then repudiated by its own vice president and the agreement he had made, this reopened the battle. If Kodak had not reneged, the issue would have ended there. Now, necessity moved in. As the lines were drawn for battle, it became clear that the usual strategy of demonstrations and confrontations would be unavailing. While Kodak's buildings and administration were in Rochester, its real life was throughout its American and overseas markets. Demonstrations might be embarrassing and inconvenient, but they would not be the tactic to force an agreement. It wasn't Rochester that Eastman Kodak was concerned about. Their image in the community could always be sustained by sheer financial power. Their vulnerability was throughout the nation and overseas. We, began, we then began looking for appropriate tactics. An economic boycott was rejected because of Kodak's overwhelming domination of the film negative market. Thus, a call for an economic boycott would have been asking the American people to stop taking pictures, which obviously would not work as long as babies were being born, children were graduating, having birthday parties, getting married, going on picnics, and so forth. The idea of boycott did evoke thoughts of checking out the Sherman Antitrust Act against them at some point. Other wild ideas were tossed around as well. The proxy idea first came up as a way to gain entrance to the annual stockholders meeting for harassment and publicity. And again, accident and necessity played a part. I had recently accepted a number of invitations to address universities, religious conventions, and similar organizations in various parts of the United States. Why not talk to them about the Kodak fight battle and ask for proxies? Why not accept all speaking invitations, even, if it meant 90 consecutive days in 90 different places? It wouldn't cost us a penny. These places not only paid fees to my organization, but they also paid travel expenses. <clears throat> and so it began, with nothing specific in mind except to ask Eastman Kodak stockholders to assign their proxies to the Rochester Black Organization or come to the stockholders meeting and vote in favor of fight. 
there was never any thought, then or now, of using proxies to gain economic power inside the corporation or to elect directors of the board. I couldn't be less interested in having a couple of directors elected to the board of Kodak or any other corporation. As long as the opposition has the majority, that's it. Also, boards of directors are only rubber stamps of management. With the exception of some management people retired to the board, the rest of them don't know which way is up. The first real breakthrough followed my address to the National Utilitarian Convention in Denver on May 3rd, 1967 in which I asked for and received the passage of a resolution that the proxies of their organization would be given to fight. The reactions of the local politicians made me realize that senators and congressmen up for re-election would turn to their research directors and ask, how many unit Unitarians have I got in my district? The proxy tactic now began to look like a possible political bank shot. Political leaders who saw their churches as signing proxies to us, could see them assigning their votes as well. This meant political power. Kodak has money, but money counts in elections for television time, newspaper ads, political workers, publicity payoffs, and pressures. If this fails to get the vote, money is politically useless. It was obvious that politicians who would support us had everything to gain. Proxies were now seen as proof of political intent if they came from large membership organizations. The church organization had mass members, voters. It meant publicity, and publicity meant pressure on political candidates and incumbents. We hoisted a banner with our slogan, Keep your sermons, give us your proxies, and set sail into the sea of churches. I couldn't help noting the irony that churches, having sold their spiritual birthright in exchange for donations of stock, could now go straight again by giving their proxies to the poor. The pressure began to build. Only, my only concern was whether Kodak would get the message. Never before or since have I encountered an American corporation so politically insensitive. I wondered whether Kodak would have, uh, would have to be brought before a Senate subcommittee hearing before it would wake up and give in. The building of political support would have prepared the ground for two actions. A Senate subcommittee hearing in which a number of practices would be exposed. And two, the possibility of an investigation by the Attorney General's office. Kodak would reconsider dealing with us if those two were the alternatives. I had an understanding with the late Senator Robert Kennedy to advise him when we were ready to move. In my discussions with Kennedy, I found that his commitment was not political, but human. He was outraged by the conditions in the Rochester ghetto. I began looking over the national scene for avenues of attack. Foundations such as Ford, Rockefeller, Carnegie, and others with substantial investments were ostensibly committed to social progress. So were union retirement funds. I planned to ask them, if you're on the level, then prove it at no cost to yourselves. We're not asking for a penny, just assign us the proxies of the stock you hold. The effect of foundation proxies would, of course, be marginal, since their proxies, unlike those of the churches, represented no constituencies. Even so, they weren't to be dismissed. Other ideas then began to occur. This was a whole new ball game for me and my curiosity sent me scurrying and sniffing at many opportunities in this great Wall Street wonderland. I, don't, I didn't know where I was going, but that part was of the fascination. I wasn't the least worried. I knew that accident or necessity or both would tell us, hey, go this way. Since I didn't seem disturbed or confused, everyone believed I had a secret and totally organized Machiavellian campaign. No one suspected the truth. The Los Angeles Times said, The Kodak proxy battle created waves throughout the corporate world. Heads of several large corporations and representatives of some mutual funds have tried to contact Alinsky for, uh, to ferret out the rest of his plans. One corporation executive told a reporter, when I asked him what he was going to do next, he said he did not know. I do not believe that. A reporter asked Alinsky what he's going to do next with the proxies. Quote, I honestly do not know, he said. Sure, I have plans, but you know, that a, th that a thing like this opens up its own possibilities. Things you never thought of. Man, we can have a ball. A real ball. 
this was all virgin territory. In the past, a few individuals had gone to stockholders' meetings to sound off, but at best, they were minor irritants. No one had ever organized a campaign to use proxies for social and political purpose. The good old establishment made, us, made its usual con a contribution. Corporate, uh, corporation executives sought me out. Their anxious questions convinced me that we had the razor to cut through the golden curtain that protected the so-called private sector from facing public responsibilities. Business publications added their violent attacks and convinced me further. In all my wars with the establishment, I had never seen it so uptight. I knew there was dynamite in the proxy scene, but where, where meant how. As I meandered around this jungle, looking for some kind of a, patter, a power pattern, I began to notice things. Look, DuPont owns a nice piece of Kodak, and so does this and that corporation. And those mutual funds, they've got more than $60 billion in stock investments, and their holdings include Cody, a Kodak. After all, mutual funds have annual meetings and proxies too. Suppose we had proxies in every corporation in America, and suppose we were fighting Corporation X, and suppose we also had proxies for the various corporations that had stock in Corporation X, and proxies for other corporations that had stock in corporations that had stock in Corporation X. Soon, I was intoxicated by the possibilities. You could begin to play the whole Wall Street board up and down. You could go to, say, Corporation Z, point out your proxy holding there, mention that there were certain grievances you had against them for some of their bad policy operations, but that you were willing to forget about them for the time being. If they would use their stock to put pressure on Corporation Q for the sake of influencing Corporation X. The same muscle could be applied to Corporation Q itself. You could make, deal, make your deals up and down. Always operating in your favor was the self-interest of the corporations and the fact that they hate each other. This is what I would call corporate jujitsu. Recently, I was at a luncheon meeting with a number of presidents of major corporations where one of them expressed his fear that I saw things only in term of power rather from the point of view of goodwill and reason. I replied that when he and his corporation approached other corporations in, term of, in terms of reason, goodwill, and cooperation instead of going for the jugular, that would be the day that I would be happy to pursue the conversation. The conversation was dropped. Proxies represent a key to participation by the middle class, but the question was how to organize it. Imagination had had its moment. It was time for accident or necessity to both come on stage. I found myself saying, accident, accident, where the hell are you? Then it came. The Los Angeles Times carried a front page story on the proxy tactic. Soon, we were deluged with mail, including sackfuls of proxies of different corporations. One letter read, I have $10,000 to invest. What kind of stock should I buy? What kind of proxies do you need? Should I buy Dow Chemical? But the two most important letters provided the accident that pointed to the next step. Quote, enclosed, find my proxies. I wonder whether you have heard from anyone else in my suburb. If you have... I would appreciate receiving their names and addresses so that I can call a house meeting and organize a San Fernando Valley chapter of proxies for people. The second letter said, I'm all for it, but I don't know why you should have the right to decide which corporation should be attacked. After all, they are our proxies and we would like to have something to say about it. Also, we don't know why you should go to the board meetings with our proxies. Why can't we go to our proxy with our proxies? Of course, all organized and knowing what we want, but we would like to go ourselves. It was those two letters that kicked open the door. Of course. For years I'd been saying power is with people. How stupid could I have been? 
There it was. Instead of annual put-ons like Eastman Kodak's in Flemington, New Jersey, where the company buses down a dozen loads of stockholding payrollers to a public school auditorium for a day off with a pay and a free lunch, and a crummy one at that, they sing out their Sig Heils and back to Rochester. Let's make them hold their meetings in New Jersey or Newark in the ballpark or outdoors in Atlantic City where thousands and thousands of proxy holders can attend. Yankee Stadium in New York or Soldier Field in Chicago would be better. But many of America's corporations are incorporated in special protective sanctuaries like New Jersey or Delaware and would claim that they must meet in these states. Well, President Nixon had set up the precedent for sanctuaries. Let's see what happens when Flemington, New Jersey, with its one beat-up hotel and two motels, faces an invasion of 50,000 stockholders. Will the state call out the National Guard to keep stockholders out of their annual meeting? Remember, these are not hippies, but American citizens in the most establishment sense. Stockholders. What could be more American than that? Let's imagine a situation in which 75,000 people vote no. And one man says, on behalf of the majority of the proxies assigned to management, I vote I, and the eyes have it. I would dare management to expose themselves in this way. But the real importance of those letters was that they showed a way for the middle class to organize. These people, the vast majority of Americans who feel helpless in the huge corporate economy, who don't know which way to turn, have begun to turn away from America to abdicate as citizens. Their rationalization, they rationalize their actions by saying that, after all, the experts in the government will take care of, of, of it all. They are like the have-nots who, when unorganized and powerless, simply resign themselves to a sad scene. Proxies can be the mechanism by which these people can organize, and once they are organized, they will re-enter the life of politics. Once organized around proxies, they will have a reason to examine, to become educated about the various corporation policies and practices, both domestic and foreign, because now they can do something about them. There will, be, there will even be fringe benefits. Trips to stockholder meetings will bring drama and adventure into otherwise colorless and sedentary suburban lives. Proxy organizations will help bridge the generation gap as parents and children join in the battle against the Pentagon and corporations. Proxies can be the effective path to the Pentagon. The late General Douglas MacArthur, in his farewell speech to Congress, uttered a half-truth. Old generals never die. They just fade away. General MacArthur should have completed his statement by saying, they fade away to Lockheed, Boeing, General Dynamics, and other corporations. Two years before retirement, a general will be found already scouting and setting up his fade away corporate sanctuary. One can envisage, envisage the scene where a general informs a corporate executive that a $50 million order will be coming to the corporation for the making of nerve gas, napalm, defoliants, or any of, uh, other of the great products we export for the benefit of mankind. Instead of a reaction of gratitude and a, general, and a general, as soon as you retire, we would like to talk to you about your future, he encounters a, well, look, general. I appreciate your considering us for this contract, but we've got stockholders meeting coming up next month and the hell that would blow when these thousands of stockholders heard about it. Well, general, I don't want to think about it. And we certainly couldn't keep it quiet. It's been very nice seeing you. Now, what has happened? First of all, the general has suddenly realized that corporations are backing away from the whole war scene. Secondly, the fact that thousands of stockholders would be opposed to this becomes translated to him as thousands of American citizens. Not long hairs, not troublemakers, not reds, but 200% bona fide Americans. One could begin to communicate with the unique, allegedly, mentality of the Pentagon species. What will be required 
is a computerized operation that will quickly give, one, a breakdown of the holdings of any corporation, two, a breakdown of holdings of other corporations that own shares in the target corporation, and three, a breakdown of individual stock proxies in the target corporation and in the corporations that have holdings in the target corporation. It will be necessary to keep the records of individual proxies confidential to protect people who would rather not let their neighbors know how many stocks they own. There will be a nationwide organization set up either by well, myself or others with national headquarters in Chicago or New York or both. The New York office could handle all of the computerized operations with the Chicago office serving as headquarters for staff of organizers who would be constantly on the move through the various communities of America from San Fernando Valley to Baltimore and all places in between. Responding to the interest and requests of local suburban groups, they would be using their skills to set up organization meetings and to train volunteer, uh, volunteer organizations to carry on. The staff organizers would approach each scene with only one thing in mind, to get a mass-based middle-class organization started. The proxy tactic will be common to all these groups, and each group will gather in any other issues around which people will organize. They may start by setting up study groups on corporate policies, making recommendations as to the corporations which should be communicated with, and electing one of theirs as a representative to a national board. The national board will be responsible for the decisions as to corporate targets, issues and policies, and various other uh, matters. The various representatives on the national board will also be responsible for recruiting members of their own local organizations for attendance at the annual stockholders meeting. On this national board will also be representatives of all kinds of consumer organizations as well as churches and other institutions committed to this program. They'd be able to contribute individually, individual uh, invaluable technical advice as well as support of their own membership. And remember, the, object, uh, the objective of the proxy's approach is not simply a power instrument with reference to our corporate economy, but a mechanism providing for a blast-off for middle-class organization, beginning with the proxy. It will be, then begin to ignite other rockets on the whole political scene from local elections to Congress. Once a person, once a people are organized, they will keep moving from issue to issue. People power is the real objective. The proxies are simply a means to the end. This total operation would require special fundraising for a budget essential to the operation. There are many who are already volunteering time and money, but the fundraising will be difficult since it's obvious that there will be no contributions from corporations or foundations. Also, none of the contributions would be tax deductible. Unquestionably, corporations would fight back by pointing out to stockholders that prevention programs on um, pollution, the rejection of war contracts, or other demands of the stockholders will result in diminished dividends. By the time this occurs, the stockholders will find such satisfaction and meaningfulness in their campaign that these will become more important than the cut in dividends, ideally. Corporations will change their cor contribution of stocks to universities. Already it's said that the University of Rochester's Kodak stock cannot be voted by the university, that the voting power is retained by Kodak management, and this presents an interesting legal question. These are are some of the potentials and problems of the, uh, of the proxy operation on the American scene. It can mark the beginning of a whole new kind of campaign on campuses against university administration through their stock holdings. On May 12, 1970, the Stanford University trustees voted their 24,000 shares of General Motors stock in favor of management in disregard of Stanford student proposals to use, to use the stock proxies against management. The same at University of California with 100,000 shares, University of Michigan with 29,000 shares, University of Texas with 66,000 shares, Harvard with 287,000 shares, and MIT with 291,500 shares. The exceptions were the University of Pennsylvania and Antioch College, where their respective 29,000 and 1,000 shares were voted for a student-supported proposal. Talk about a relevant college curriculum. What could be more educational than for students to begin to study American corporation policy and to get involved at stockholders' meetings by means of university proxies? For years, universities have, without compunction, gone in for what they call field research and action programs amongst the poor. But when it comes to research plus action among corporations, they tend to balk. I suggest that America's corporations are a spiritual slum and their arrogance is the major threat to our future as a free society. 
There will and there should be a major struggle on the university campuses on this, of this country on this issue. If I go into this, as, uh, if, if I go into this, it means me uh, leaving the Industrial Areas Foundation after 30 years, the organization that I built. What will probably happen will be that others will come forth to give full time to this campaign and that I would be with it full time for its launching and its setting out of s to sea. But if after what we've seen about the genesis of the tactic, uh, tactic proxy, it's not clear that the genesis of proxies for people is unpredictable, that it will develop by accidents, needs, and imagination, then both of us have wasted our time, me in recording all this and you in reading it. Recently, one of President Nixon's chief White House advisors told me proxies for people would mean revolution. They'll never let you get away with it. I believe he's right that it would mean revolution. It could mean the organization for power of a previously silent people. The way of proxy participation could mean the democratization of corporate America. It could result in the changing of the foreign operations, which would cause major shifts in national foreign policy. This could be one of the single most important breakthroughs in the revolutions of our times. <clears throat> Last chapter, y'all. Last chapter. We're almost there. We're almost there. <sighs> Bye, Aka. Bye, Aka. Is there anything that I need to address while I'm in between chapters? Is there, we good? Can I just move on to the last chapter? I mean, I just did. I just took a drink. Ah. Uh. Eastman Chemical is still alive and well, Square. Um, yeah. Probably because they said something stupid and baity and fucking are a Scott viewer. So he doesn't get the benefit of uh, doubt for good faith argumentation, probably. There we go. Um, I, <clears throat> then I'm going to continue on, get this done. <sighs> the way ahead. Organization for action will now, and in the decade ahead, center upon America's white middle class. That's where the power is. When more than three-fourths of our people, from both the point of view of economics and of their self-identification, are middle class, it's obvious that their action or inaction will determine the direction of change. Large parts of the middle class, the silent majority, must be activated. Action and articulation are one, as are silence and surrender. We are belatedly beginning to understand this, to know that even if all the low-income parts of our population are, were organized, all the blacks, Mexican-Americans, Puerto Ricans, Appalachians, poor whites, if through some genius of organization they were all united into a coalition, it would not be powerful enough to get significant basic needs changed. It would have to do what all minority organizations, small nations, labor unions, political parties, or anything small must do. Seek out allies. The pragmatics of power will not allow any alternative. The only potential allies for America's poor would be in various organized sectors of the middle class. We have seen Cesar Chavez's migrant farm workers turn to the middle class with their great boycott. In the fight against Eastman Kodak, the blacks of Rochester, New York, turned to the middle class and their proxies. Activists and radicals on and off our college campuses, people who are committed to change, must make a complete turnabout. 
With rare exceptions, our activists and radicals are products of and re rebels against our middle class society. All rebels must attack the power states in their society. Our rebels have contemptuously rejected the values and way of life of the middle class. They have, st uh, they have stigmatized it as materialistic, decadent, bourgeois, degenerate, imperialistic, warmongering, brutalized, and corrupt. They are right. But we must begin from where we are if we are to build power for change. And the power and the people are in the big middle class majority. Therefore, it is useless self-indulgence for an activist to put their past behind them. Instead, they should realize the priceless value of their middle class experience. Their middle class identity, their familiarity with the values and problems are invaluable for organization of their own people. They have the background to go back, examine, and try to understand the middle class way. Now they have a compelling reason to know, for they must know if they are to organize. They, they must know so they can be effective in communication, tactics, creating issues, and organization. They will look very differently upon their parents, their friends, and their way of life. Instead of the infantile dramatics of rejection, they will now begin to dissect and examine that way of life as they never have before. They will know that a square is no longer to be dismissed as such. Instead, their own approach must be square enough to get the action started. Turning back to the middle class as an organizer, they will find that everything now has different meaning and purpose. They learn, um, they learn to view actions outside of the experience of people as serving only to confuse and antagonize them. They begin to understand the differences in value definition of the older generation regarding, quote, the privilege of college experience and their current reaction to the tactics a sizable major, uh, minority of students uses in campus rebellions. They discover what their definition of the police is and their language. They discard the rhetoric that always says pig. Instead of hostile rejection, they're seeking bridges of communication and unity over the gaps, generation, value of others. They will view with strategic sensitivity the nature of middle class behavior with its hangups over rudeness or aggressiveness, insulting profane actions. All this and more must be grasped and used to radicalize parts of the middle class. The rough category middle class can be broken down into three groups. Lower middle class, middle middle class, and upper middle class. There are marked cultural differences between the lower middle class and the rest of the middle class. In the lower middle class, we encounter people who have struggled all their lives for what relatively little they have. With a few exceptions, such as teachers, they have never gone beyond high school. They have been committed to the values of success, getting ahead, security, having their own, own home, auto, color TV, friends. Their lives have been 90% unfulfilled dreams. To escape their frustration, they grasp at the last hope that their children will get that education and realize their unfulfilled dreams. They are a fearful people who, who feel threatened from all sides. The nightmare of pending retirement in old age with social security decimated by inflation. The shadow of unemployment from a slumping economy. With the black community already fierce, uh, fearsome because the cultural conflict, threatening job competition, the high cost of long-term illness, and finally with mortgages outstanding, they dread the possibility of pop property devaluation from non-whites moving into their neighborhood. They're beset by taxes on incomes, food, real estate, and automobiles at all levels, city, state, and national. Seduced by their values into installment buying, they find themselves barely able to meet long-term payments, let alone the current cost of living. Victimized by TV commercials with their fraudulent claims for food and medical products, they watch the news between the commercial with Senate committee hearings showing that their purchase of these products is largely a waste of their hard-earned money. 
repeated financial crises result from accidents that they thought they were insured against only to experience the fine print evasions of one of our most shocking confidence rackets of today, the insurance racket. Their pleasures are simple. Gardening a tiny backyard behind a small house, bungalow or tiki-taki, in a monotonous subdivision on the fringe of suburbs, going on a Sunday drive out to the country, having a once-a-week dinner out at some place like a Howard Johnson's. Many of the so-called hard hats, police, fire, sanitation workers, school teachers, and much of civil service, mechanics, electricians, janitors, and semi-skilled workers find themselves in this class. They look at the unemployed poor as parasitical dependents, recipients of a vast variety of massive public programs, all paid for the, by them, the public. They see the poor going to college with the waiving of admission requirements and given spe special financial aid. In many cases, the lower middle class were denied the opportunity of college by those very circumstances. Their bitterness is compounded by their also paying taxes for these colleges for increased public services, fire, police, public health, and welfare. They hear the poor demanding welfare as rights. To them, this is an insult on top of injury. Seeking some meaning in life, they turn to an extreme chauvinism and become defenders of the American faith. Now, they even develop rationalizations for a life of futility and frustration. It's the red menace. Now, they're not only the most uh, vociferous in their espousal of law and order, but ripe victims for such a demagogic George Wallace, the John Birch Society, the Red Menace perennials. Insecure in this fast-changing world, they cling to illusory fixed points, which are very, very real to them. Even conversation is charted towards fixing your position in the world. I don't want to argue with you. Just tell me what our flag means to you. Or, what do you think of those college punks who never worked a day in their lives? They use revealing adjectives such as outside agitators or troublemakers. And other, when did you last beat your wife? Questions. On the other side, they see the middle middle class and the upper middle class assuming a liberal, democratic, holier-than-thou position and attacking the bigotry of the employed poor. They see, through that, uh, see that through all kinds of tax evasion devices, the middle, middle, and upper middle can elude their share of the tax burdens so that most of it comes back, as they see it, upon themselves. The lower middle class. They see a United States Senate in which approximately one-third are millionaires, and it's more now, and the rest, with rare exception, very wealthy. The bill requiring full public disclosure of senators' financial interests and prophetically titled Senate Bill 1993, which is probably the year it will be finally be passed, is in committee, they see. And then they say to themselves, government represents the upper class, not us. Many of the lower middle class are members of labor unions, churches, bowling clubs, fraternals, service and nationality organizations. They are organizations and people that must be worked with as one would work with any part other part of our population with respect, understanding, and sympathy. To reject them is to lose by default. They will not shrivel. They will not disappear. You can't switch channels and get rid of them. This is what you have been doing in your radicalized dream world, but they are here and will be. If we don't win them, Wallace or Spiro T. Nixon will. Never doubt uh, that the voice may be Agnew's, but the words, the vindictive smearing is Nixon's. There never was a vice president who didn't either faithfully serve as his superior's faithful sounding board or else be silent. Remember that even if you cannot win over the lower middle class, at least parts of them must be persuaded to where there is at least communication then to a series of partial agreements and a willingness to abstain from hard opposition as changes take place. They have their role to play in the essential prelude of reformation, in their acceptance that the ways of the past with its promises for the future no longer work 
And we must move ahead. Where we move to may not be definite or certain, but move we must. People must be reformed so that they can be de- uh, so that oh, Jesus so that they cannot be deformed into dependency and driven through desperation to dictatorship and the death of freedom. The silent majority now are hurt, bitter, suspicious, feeling rejected and at bay. This sick condition in many ways is as explosive as the current race crisis. Their fears and frustrations at their helplessness are mounting to a point of political paranoia which can demonize people to turn to the law of survival in the narrowest sense. These emotions can go either to the far right of totalitarianism or forward to Act II of the American Revolution. The issues of 1972 would be those of of 1776. No taxation without representation. To have real representation would involve public funds being available for campaign costs so that members of the lower middle class can campaign for political office. This can be an issue for mobilization among the lower middle class and substantial sectors of the middle middle class. The rest of the middle class, with few exceptions, reside in suburbia, living in illusions of partial escape, being more literate. They are even more lost. Nothing seems to make sense. They thought that a split-level house in the suburbs, two cars, two TVs, country club membership, a bank account, children in good prep schools, and then in college, and they they had it made. They got it, only to discover they didn't have it. Many have lost their children. They dropped out of sight into something called the generation gap. They have seen values they held sacred, sneered at, and found themselves ridiculed as squares or relics of a dead world. The frenetic scene around them is so bewildering as to induce them to either drop out into a private world, the non-existent past, sick with its own form of social schizophrenia, or to face it and to move into action. If one wants to act, the dilemma is how and where. There is no when, with time running out. Time is obviously now. There are enormous basic changes ahead. We cannot continue or last in the nihilistic absurdities of our time, where nothing we do makes sense. The scene around us compels us to look away quickly, if we are to cling to any sanity. We are the age of pollution, progressively burying ourselves in our own waste. We announce that our water is contaminated by our own excrement, insecticides, and detergents, and then do nothing. Even a half-witted people, if sane, would long since have developed the simple and obvious— Ban the detergents, develop non-polluting insecticides, and immediately build waste disposal units. Apparently, we would rather be corpses in clean shirts. We prefer a strangling ring of dirty air to a ring around the collar. Until the last, we'll be buried in bright white shirts. Our persistent use of our uh, present insecticides may well ensure that the insects shall inherit the world. Of all the pollution around us, none compares to the political pollution of the Pentagon. From a Vietnam War simultaneously suicidal and murderous to a policy of getting out by getting in deeper and wider to the Pentagon reports that strained even a moron's intelligence that within the next six months the war would be won, to destroying more bridges in North Vietnam than there are in the world, to counting and reporting the enemy dead from his helicopters, quote, okay, Joe, we've been here for 15 minutes, let's go back and call it 150 dead, to brutalizing our younger generation with my, li- uh, with my lies, but ignoring our own principles of the Nuremberg trials, to putting our soldiers in conditions so conducive to drugs that we stand forth as freedom's liberating force of pot, This Pentagon, whose economic waste and corruption is bankrupting our nation morally as well as economically, allows Lockheed Aircraft to put one-fourth of its production in the small Georgia country town of the late Senator Russell, a powerful man in the military appropriations decisions, and then transmits its appeal for federal millions to save it from financial fiascos. Far worse is the situation in the late Representative Mendel Rivers' congressional district, he of the House Military Affairs Committee, where the phenomenal payoffs of every kind of installation from corporations vying for Pentagon gold. 
Even our solid state mental vice president described it in a way he thought was amusing, but is tragic beyond belief to any freedom loving American quote. Vice President Agnew praised Mr. Rivers for his willingness to go to bat for the so-called and often discredited military-industrial complex as 1,150 generals, congressmen, and defense contractors applauded in a ballroom in the Washington Hilton Hotel. Mr. Agnew said he wanted to lay down the re uh, to rest the ugly, vicious, dastardly rumor that Mr. Rivers, whose Charleston, Charleston, South Carolina district is chock full of military installations, is trying to move the Pentagon piecemeal to South Carolina. Even when it appeared Charleston might sink into the sea from the burden, said the uh, vice president, Mr. Rivers' response was, I regret that I have but one congressional district to my country, uh, to my country too. I mean, give to my country. New York Times, August 13th, 1970. This is the Pentagon that has manufactured nearly 16,000 tons of nerve gas. Why and what for being unclear to, except to overkill the overkill. No one has raised the question. Who got the contracts? What did it cost? Where, where were the payoffs? Where did they go? Now the big question is how to dispose of it as it deteriorates and threatens to get loose amongst us. The Pentagon announces that the sinking of the nerve gas is safe, but from now on they will find a safe way. The obvious American way of assuming personal responsibility for one's action is utterly ignored. Otherwise, since the Pentagon made it, it should keep it and have all of it stored in the basements of the Pentagon. Or since the president as commander in chief of our armed forces believe that the sinking in the ocean of the 67 tons of nerve gas was so safe. Why didn't he attest to his belief by having it dumped into the waters off San Clemente, California? Either action would at least have given some hope for the nation's future. The record goes on without any deviations towards sanity. The Army chose the final days of hearings of the President's Commission investigating the National Guard killings at Kent State to announce that M-16 rifles would now be issued to the National Guard. The President's Commission report is doomed not to be read until after the bowl games on New Year's Day by a president who watches football on TV the afternoon of the biggest march in history on Washington, Moratorium Day. There are our generals and... Their scientific gremlins who, after assurance of no reactive, uh, re radioactive menace from the atomic tests in Nevada, now, more than a dozen years later, have sealed off 250 square miles as contaminated with poisonous and radioactive plutonium-239. This from the explosions in 1958. Will the safe disposition in 1970 of the nerve gas still be as safe a dozen or less years from now? One can only wonder how they'll seal off some 250 miles of the Atlantic Ocean. We can assume that the same scientific gremlins will uh, be assigned to the disposition of the thousands of tons of additional stockpiled nerve gas, out of which approximately 15,000 tons are on Okinawa to be moved to some other island. Compound this with a daily record of now we are in Cambodia, now we are out, now we're not in, it's just over it with our bombers, now we won't get involved as we are in Vietnam, but we can't get out of Vietnam without safeguarding Cambodia. We're doing this, but really the other with no clue to all this madness except the half helpful comment from the White House, don't listen to what we say, just watch what we do. Half helpful only because either statements or actions are sufficient to make us freeze into bewilderment and stunned disbelief. It's in such times that we are haunted by the old maxim, those whom the gods would destroy, they first make ludicrous. The middle class are numb, bewildered, scared into silence. They don't know what, if anything, they can do. This is the job for today's radical. To fan the embers of hopelessness into a flame to fight. To say, you cannot cop out as many, uh, as many of my generation. You cannot turn away. Look at it. Let us change it together. Look at us. We are your children. Let us not abandon each other, for then we are all lost. Together we can change it for what we want. Let's start here and there. Let's go. It is a job first of bringing hope and doing what every organizer must do with all people, all classes, all places, and all times. Communicate the means or tactics whereby the people can feel that they have the power to do this and that 
and so on. To a great extent, the middle class of today feels more defeated and lost than do our poor. So you return to the suburban scene of your middle class with its variety of organizations, from PTAs to League of Women Voters, consumer groups, churches and clubs. The job is to search out the leaders in these various activities, identify their major activities, find areas of common agreement, and excite their imagination with tactics that can introduce drama and adventure into the tedium of middle life, class, uh, middle class life. Tactics must begin with the experiences of the middle class, accepting their aversion to rudeness, vulgarity, and conflict. Start them easy. Don't scare them off. The opposition's reactions will provide the education or the radicalization of the middle class. It does it every time. Tactics here, are already, as already described, will develop in the flow of the action and reaction. The chance for organization for action on pollution, inflation, war, violence, race, taxes, and other issues is all about us. Tactics such as stock proxies and others are waiting to be hurled into the attack, if you so choose. The revolution must manifest itself in the corporate sector by the corporation's realistic appraisal of conditions in the nation. The corporations must forget their nonsense about private sectors. It's not just the government con contracts and subsidies that have long since blurred the line between public and private sectors, but that every American individual or corporation is public as well as private. Public in that we are Americans and concerned about our national welfare. We have a double commitment and corporations had better recognize this for the sake of their own survival. Poverty, discrimination, disease, crime. Everything is as much a concern for the corporations as it is profits. The days when corporate public relations work to keep the corporation out of controversy, days of playing it safe, of not offending Democratic or Republican customers, advertisers, or associates. Those days are done. If the same predatory drives for profit can be partially transmuted for progress, then we'll have opened up a whole new ballgame. I suggest here that this new policy will give its executives a reason for what they are doing, a chance for a meaningful life. A major battle will be pitched on quality and prices of consumer goods, targeting particularly on the massive misleading advertising campaigns, the cost of which are passed on to the consumer. It will be the people against Madison Avenue or the Battle of Buncombe Hill. Any timetable would be speculation, but the writing of middle class organizations had better be on the wall by 1972. The human cry of the second revolution is one for a meaning, a purpose for life, a cause to live for, and if need be, die for. Thomas Paine's words these are the times that try men's souls are more relevant to part two of the American Revolution than the beginning. This is literally the revolution of the soul. The great American dream that reached out to the stars has been lost to the stripes. We have forgotten where we came from. We don't know where we are, and we fear where we may be going. Afraid, we turn from the glorious adventure of the pursuit of happiness to a pursuit of an illusionary security in an ordered, stratified, striped society. Our way of life is symbolized to the world by stripes of military force. At home, we have made a mockery of being our brother's keeper by being his jail keeper. When Americans can no longer see the stars, the times are tragic. We must believe that it is the darkness before the dawn of a beautiful new world. We'll see it. <laughs> we'll see it when we believe it. Ah, uh, that was Rules for Radical by the late great Saul Alinsky. We just finished it. Oh, oh stretch, stretch, stretch. Uh, yeah. Rip to a real one. Uh, Oh. All right.
Spent a lot of time there. Oh, ah, oh. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Weather. Uh, all right, what do I got? I didn't see any of these people. Yeah, I didn't see any of these people. Oh, what did he say? Hold on. Okay. All right, let me turn some stuff back on. There we go. Oh, so happy having onboard fucking stream stuff. Rather, uh, on device stream stuff rather than fucking stream elements and fucking stream labs and shit. Just having my own program on my own fucking computer. So much easier. Um, we will, I will get those up later tonight. So the, um, rules for radicals playlist will be complete. Um, oh, this book has taken a beating over the years. <laughs> oh, it has. When was this, when was this written? Just out of curiosity. <laughs> he died the year after he, this, yeah. Um, yeah. Oh, year, less than a, three months. I, I saw the. I just saw the year day of uh, the year square. Yeah. Oh, fucking a. Well, that's that. Pro, uh, that's that um, playlist complete. Um, we still need to. We still need to work on some Bob Black, um, and also I told Kaiser we would start um, anarchism in Korea as well. Um, I also want to do. Post Anarchism by Saul Newman. That's that's on my to-do list uh, for sure. Um, I also want to do um, Property is Theft by um, by Proudhon. I think it's important to have that in the the list as well. Um, just out of curiosity, give me a sec here. It is. Okay. All right. Is it broken into sections? Yeah, it is. Okay. So it's got five chapters. Five chapters. Yeah. Okay. Cool. I think we're probably going to do what is property next. Um... And then we'll go from there. <laughs> You're a fucking idiot. Uh, property is an investment, not theft. You don't even know definitionally, legally, economically, what property is. Ugh. Yeah, I, I I thought we had finally I I, th I thought we didn't have to see this ge this genius back again, but apparently apparently the gods have graced us with a certain level of fucking stupidity today, between the 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 ancaps and the fucking uh, Australian nationalists and the um, general cop bootlicker types. Yes. Um, it definitely is one of those days. <laughs> you you want it? Here you go. Beta. There you go, Viva. Um. Oh. Fucking it! It is a it is one of those days. Proper tea is made by the tea wizard. Yes. T 
Tim the Tea Wizard makes the best proper tea. Um, yeah, we'll do. We'll start. I want to get. I want to get fucking property is theft done. Um, I've been wanting that one in the list, and there's only five chapters to it. It's like fifty-one pages, something like that. Um, so yeah, we'll 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 bang those out over this coming week, maybe. The Australian guy was wild. Dude, fucking, I mean, Australian nationalism. That was weird. Like, your country is just as stupid as ours. Stop trying to fucking act like you're something. Um, yeah, uh, I think we could we could possibly bang most of... Uh, the, the, the harvest is bountiful. Um, most of property is theft out this week. Um... Hey, the piercing jewelry will be here Wednesday, ideally. If UPS holds true, it'll be here Wednesday, which means it goes in, the new one goes in Saturday. Um, and that means in another four months or so. So is April, yeah, we're in April. So August or so, I'll, I'll have it up to the size I really want it. <clears throat> Um, maybe, <laughs> uh, <laughs> whether you're always struggling with that keyboard, aren't you? Um, oh yeah. Yeah. I know, I know the international standard for tea making fucking Tom Scott video Excel, but that's not the proper way to make tea. Who's a communist? You've said that you've said that twice now, big era. Who's a fucking communist? You know what? I'm d I'm tired of this shit. Dude, Bagheera, either get on the air or just shut up, man. <laughs> yeah, get on the air. Have the conversation. Be a, f be a big boy and engage. Yeah, like, why am I fucking... Dude, you've been here fucking long enough. You're fucking bullshit tra fucking troll bait shit. Ain't gonna work. Get on the fucking air. Shut the fuck up, man. Actually have a conversation with like somebody with a pair of nuts on him. Otherwise, you can just take that fucking little castrated, impotent male bullshit somewhere else. So. Um, I don't know what's going on in there, but I'm seeing like knife talk. Okay. Rev and what the fuck, man? This one, this one, Rev and Caleb both knock it the fuck off. I don't know what the fuck you two are up to, but if I have to fucking start cracking skulls here, fucking I will knock it the fuck off. End up having to ban both of your dumb asses. Because you two don't know when to put your dicks back in your fucking pants. Jesus goddamn Christ. <laughs> anyway, did... Oh, God, he's just fucking saying fuck liberals because he's an idiot. He doesn't even see this is the thing. He won't even. Um, how did that ever get pe fucking a mythic? How the fuck did that? Um, how the fuck? I still that emote. How the fuck that emote got through? Um, yeah, <laughs> Los Castrados still impotent. Impotence. Um, yeah, he's like, he's fucking this, he just, I don't, I don't know what's fucking wrong with Bagheera. Like, I don't know what's, what goes on there. That's okay, Cassidy. Um. Cassidy. Cassidy, where are you in my DMs?
Cassie, I just sent you a DM on Discord. Please and thank you. Oh, Viva, wait, people are putting their dicks back in? Um, so, yeah. We, um, so we got Saul Alinsky done. We got, uh, fucking, we'll get that done. Okay. Now do this. Whoa. Thank you, Cassidy. Oh. Oh yes, I did. You're you're welcome, Zippy. You're you're welcome. Oh, so yeah. Um, so we got Popo's Bizarre Adventures done. Uh, for last week, we got um fucking we got uh, uh fucking rules for radicals closed out. Um, and now we can just sort of move on. Like I said, we're going to start property is theft by Alinsky, uh, by Alinsky property is theft by Proudhon, um, this week, probably since it's only five chapters, we can bang it out pretty effectively. Um, and we'll go from there and uh, yeah. Oh, Um, I, I, yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna raid over to, um, endless, um, my mind is already in the post show workflow, frankly, um, <laughs> I'm already doing video editing in my head. Um, we're going to raid over to endless and Tomorrow's the After Dark show. I'm definitely not going to um, smoke as much. Like, I'm not going to take the kind of heat hit that fucking um, I took last time. Dude, that, that last one fucking, dude, that was a rough fucking stream. I was entirely too, uh, too fucking high for that. Um, so, yeah. Tomorrow, After Dark show. Maybe we'll do some Proudhon first at the top of the show, and then we'll we'll get a little loose. I don't know. We'll see how I feel about that. Uh, either way, uh, I think we're nearing the end, and we're gonna raid out to to endless. So we shall see how we uh, what we end up with. Um, there we go. 